Chapter 37, I Love You Natasha's Safe House, New York September 9, 2007, 0900 H Local Naruto and Natasha are currently making breakfast in the kitchen, while Jessica was still sleeping on the bed. Ever since Jessica decided to join their weird partnership, Natasha was able to wake up a lot earlier after a night of sex. When Naruto came back an hour after his abrupt disappearance, Natasha had to talk him into accepting the new arrangement, which in Natasha, and Jessica's opinion, really weird. What guy doesn't run head straight into a threesome when it's their girlfriend who suggested it? It took Natasha almost two hours to convince Naruto even to consider the arrangement, and after that, he would only decide after knowing more about Jessica, which means they had to go to a date. Jessica almost backed out of the arrangement since, as she put it, I didn't sign up for all of this emotional shit, but as always, Natasha had talked her into saying yes. Now, a lot of other women would probably throw a fit when their boyfriend insisted on going on a date with another woman. Still, everyone else doesn't have an admittedly overpowered superhuman boyfriend that can be classified as an alien that works as the world's most feared information broker and mercenary. One of the things she figured out about Naruto is that he's an emotional individual and hiding it in a mask of cheeriness. Natasha surmised that he must have an extremely rough childhood, a lot more than he was letting on. Another quality of his is loyalty. It's hard to gain his true loyalty loyalty, but when you got it, you have it forever. She could tell that he would follow her through hell, the same as she will do for him, although no one said it to each other. Those two qualities are why Natasha already expected the date from a mile away. Naruto wouldn't just have sex with anyone. He would form some sort of emotional attachment first before doing something intimate, as he considers lovemaking a personal experience. Natasha thought for a moment that choosing Jessica, an emotionally distant individual, as a potential partner would be stupid, but they have a lot more in common. And if Jessica remained emotionally distant after that, Naruto's magnetic personality would win her. If Jessica manages to worm their way into their hearts in the future, well, that's just a problem for the future. Naruto and Jessica decided it was best for their date to happen the next day. When Jessica left, Naruto tried to question Natasha if the whole thing is some kind of trick, but another round of reassurance and Naruto believed that no traps or tricks are involved. The only condition she set was Naruto would tell her what he can about happen during the date since she knows that he would try to respect Jessica's privacy. Flashback start Naruto knocked on Jessica's door, still confused about the whole thing, but willing to just ride the waves. He's wearing a striped black and white shirt covered by a black leather jacket, a burnt orange pants, and black slip-on shoes. Natasha joined him going out of the apartment. She's going to the Shield, Shield New York field office to get a report that she needs to bring back to Washington, D.C. when she returns. Before they separate, Natasha gave him a final encouragement. Naruto briefly considered that he was trapped in an infinite Tsukiyomi, before Kurama reminded him that he has the Shinigan making every illusion useless. Naruto was still contemplating the mess he's been thrown in when Jessica opened the door. She's wearing a dark brown leather jacket and a black scarf over a pepper gray shirt, light gray jeans, and black high-heeled boots. She has her hands in her pockets, head slightly bowed down, and her hair partially covering her face. Naruto could clearly see her insecurities her desire to be anywhere away from people. Weirdly enough, her behavior reminds him of how Tsuba-chan was before she became the Hokage. That thought gave him a great idea and changed the whole date. So want to get out of here? Naruto asked cheerily. Sure, whatever. Jessica answered disinterestedly before walking out of her apartment and locking it. Naruto extended his hand towards Jessica and motioned for her to grab it. She just stared at it incredulously. What the hell is that? We're not going to do all the couple shit. Ugh. We got no time for this. Naruto mumbled before grabbing her shoulder. 
This caused Jessica to defend herself. She grabbed Naruto's hand and twisted it. She was going to break his joint, but a feeling of disorientation assaulted her senses, and their surrounding changed. Ow. 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 You can let me go now. He shouted. Jessica released her grip and observed her surroundings. They're on a side road surrounded by trees. It's colder but not too much compared to New York. She can also hear cars not too far away from them. She looked back at Naruto, who's rotating her arms. Where are we? Jessica asked. Somewhere in northern Moscow. Naruto replied. Russia. What the hell are we doing in Russia? Naruto gave her a stare like she's stupid before answering. For our date, of course. Naruto stepped aside, suddenly revealing Raijin with two helmets on top of it behind him. He walked towards the bike and wore his helmet before tossing the other one towards Jessica, who promptly caught it. Come on. He said energetically while riding the bike. This is a bad idea. Jessica whispered to herself. When huge racing bikes appear out of nowhere, you know something crazy is about to happen. It's not a bad idea if we had fun. Naruto replied to herself musing. Jessica got on the bike hesitantly, opting not to hold on to Naruto. You should grab onto something. When Jessica didn't answer, Naruto continued. Okay. Don't tell me I didn't warn you. Naruto did one last rev of the bike before quickly shooting off. Jessica had no choice but to loop her arms around Naruto's abdomen, or she would fall off. The pair quickly reached the highway, and Naruto just kept on zooming past the cars until they reached Moscow. The adrenaline surging through her body due to the bike ride caused her to be looser and more eager as they continued. Naruto continued to go through the city until they reached a small bar. Jessica could see that it's at least 50 years old. Naruto parked the bike at the alleyway behind it before motioning for her to get off. They removed their helmets and Naruto locked both of them on his motorcycle. When we get inside, let me do all the talking first until I tell you you can loosen up. Naruto instructed while retrieving something from his jacket pocket. Sure. Sure. Cause everybody speaks Russian. Jessica sarcastically replied. Don't worry. I made this for you. Naruto said while showing her a black choker. This thing would make sure you understand everything they say, and they hear everything you say, say in any language they would understand. Don't question how it works cause I'm not gonna say. He explained. Jessica pulled down her scarf before taking the choker. It's a black leather band with silver characters engraved on it. Thank you. Jessica shyly said. You're welcome. Naruto replied. The pair walked towards the front of the bar and entered it. When they got inside, Jessica saw a stereotypical dilapidated bar. Wobbly tables, creaky floorboards, all the shebang. Overall, it's a bar even she won't go to. Naruto approached the bartender. The bartender is a 5 feet 9 inches older man with balding white hair and brown eyes. He's wearing an old brown sweater over a white shirt. Grigovsky. Got any available seats? Naruto asked with a wide smile. Ah. Mr. Vasiliev. Of course, we always have a seat for you. The now named Grigovsky greeted. I see you finally brought a woman, eh? He said while nodding towards Jessica. No. Not like that. We're still getting to know each other. Naruto replied. Can you give me six bottles of your strongest drink? Sure thing. Grigovsky answered. He reached under the bar and placed six bottles of clear alcohol on the bar. Each of them are only labeled with the name Spiritus. Now, be sure not to drink this as it is. 
Naruto picked up the bottles, while passing one of them towards Jessica. He looked back at Grigovsky and placed a roll of rubles on the table. Thanks. I'll see you before leaving. Naruto said before walking behind the bar and going down the trapdoor. Jessica followed Naruto through a series of corridors below the bar in silent contemplation. She knows they are speaking in Russian, Russian, but for some reason, she can understand it, even the subtle inflections, and all of it is because of the choker she's wearing. She can't help but open the bottle and taking a swig out of it, but that proved to be a bad idea because she started coughing after only having a sip. Um. I should have warned you. That's 95% alcohol. Naruto warned although a little too late. Jessica just gave him a hard glare. They continued down a maze of corridors with Naruto confident in his step until they reached a large metal door. Naruto knocked twice and a peephole opened. A man opened the door and checked them out before closing it again. A moment later, the door opened, revealing a man that is more than likely the twin of the bartender. The difference is he's wearing a suit. Mr. Vasiliev. Welcome back. Are you going to participate or spectate? The man asked. Gregory. Good to be here too. Naruto greeted. I'm just spectating, but this lady here is going to participate. He said while pointing at Jessica. Are you sure? Gregory asked. Oh yeah. She can handle herself. Naruto replied confidently. Very well, then. Gregory turned around and walked inside the room. Jessica finally regained her presence of mind and tugged Naruto's arm to get his attention. What did you just sign me up to? Jessica said through gritted teeth. Here's the rundown. This place is a criminal paradise. A lot of the world's most wanted come through here at one point or another, and you're going to fight against every mean asshole in there. All of them are bad guys in every sense of the word. The lowest of the low. Naruto explained. You'll fight them in a no-holds-barred fight. The fight can only stop through surrender or death. Jessica finally figured out Naruto's date plan, and she had to admit she likes it. What are we waiting for? Come on. Jessica shouted as she pulled Naruto down the hallway. Flashback end. The pair came back to New York, already getting along. Natasha can't help but laugh when remembering the story of how Jessica took down Serbian commanders, African warlords, Chinese triads, and other pieces of shit. When Natasha asked about the location of the place was that it's in Moscow. Apparently, he uses it to mine information on the criminal underbelly. A few more outings similar to that, and Naruto was finally comfortable enough to try the whole thing. The first time it happened though has a lot of awkward moments, but as the night went on, it got a whole lot better. Hey. You got a safe house you don't use? Preferably a place only you know? Naruto suddenly asked out of the blue. Why? Natasha asked. She's already used to Naruto's shenanigans, but it's always best to ask him what he's his doing since he tends to spiral out of control. I got a surprise for everyone, but it would take three to five years to prepare. I need an isolated place to prepare. Naruto explained. People tend to have a mini panic attack every time you give a surprise. Natasha deadpanned. Don't worry about this one. Everyone's going to love it. Naruto reassured with that mischievous grin that she loves to hate. Natasha released a deep sigh and walked over to a stack of pen and paper near the phone. She wrote down an address and gave it to Naruto. That's a house outside a medium-sized town in Switzerland. It's far enough from the town that no one accidentally goes to it, but near enough that you can make a day of buying stuff from the town. Natasha explained. Tell me when you're done with it. I still want us to use it. She finished. 
Thank you. Naruto said while hugging her. He let go of her and picked up his jacket from the couch. I gotta go. Don't wait up for me. I love you. He kissed her before disappearing. Natasha stood in the middle of the kitchen frozen. That's the first time either one of them said the L word, and she doesn't know how to react to it. As weird as it sounds, she never heard it from anyone. Being in a top-secret training facility to produce high-level assassins doesn't precisely foster personal relationships. Her closest confidants are Barton, Coulson, and Fury in that order, and everyone would agree that they would not tell her that. She usually would talk about the new experience to Naruto, but it just won't work for this particular case. She must have been standing there for a long time since Jessica was the one who snapped her out of it. Tasha? Hey. Are you all alright? Jessica asked while shaking her gently. He told me he loves me. Natasha whispered. What? He told me he loves me. Natasha said a little louder. Are you telling me you guys pushed forward a threesome before you said the L word to each other? Jessica asked incredulously. Natasha just nodded, still in a daze. You guys are weird. RAF Base Hospital, Alconbury, UK. September 9, 2007, 1500 H Local. Naruto arrived in Peggy's room, not realizing what he said to Natasha. The beaches inside him would have told him what he's done, but they decided to let him work it out himself. Inside the locked room is Peggy and Sharon, who's visibly more relaxed compared to their previous meeting. Flashback start. I need you to die. Sharon quickly reacted and pulled the trigger into Naruto's face. A loud gunshot reverberated in the room. Naruto's head jerked back. Peggy was shocked by the development and about, and about to press the button that would call for help if the gunshot itself doesn't call for the guards. But before she could press the button, he heard a groaning sound coming from Naruto. His head slowly straightened up, revealing an unmarred face. He started moving something from inside his mouth until the carters finally saw what it was. It's the bullet Sharon shot. Undeformed. You're a step down from Clint's reaction, but still not cool. Naruto said calmly after spitting out the bullet. What are you? Sharon let out partially recovering from the surprise. Naruto just looks towards Peggy. Is she always this rude? Naruto asked seriously. Anyways. Set your affairs in order. I'll come by in five months. He instructed before looking back to Sharon. Come or don't come. I don't care but make sure not to shoot me again. It's such a pain to silence the room that quickly. Peggy and Sharon just nodded, still in a daze about what happened. Sure Shield handles the weird stuff of the world, but surviving a bullet to the head is on a whole other level. How can Shield deal with a problem like that? It's even worse than the Hulk problem since you can easily find an 8 feet green monster running around, but someone like Naruto walking around would just be a bitch to deal with. All right. I'll see you later. Naruto said with a wave. I'll just bring this with me. He said while touching the cube of vibranium. And don't tell Fury about any of this or the deal's off. He finished before him and the block of vibranium disappeared leaving a stunned set of carters in the room. Flashback end. Before we leave, I need you to leave your phone here. Don't worry. You'll get it back. I don't want anyone finding out about your aunt here. Naruto said towards Sharon, who hesitantly left her phone on the bedside table. Naruto then took hold of Sharon and Peggy's hand before disappearing. As soon as they were gone, Two reinforced Naruto clones showed up, up in the room, and henged into Peggy and Sharon. Peggy went to bed and laid down while Sharon took the phone and left the room. Chapter 38, Carter's Death John, Switzerland 
September 9, 2007, 1630 H. Local. Naruto, Peggy, and Sharon appeared inside a living room of a fully furnished home. They can see through the window that the house is built on the side of the mountain, evident by the majestic scenery of white-capped mountain ranges and pine trees. This where you are going to stay for the foreseeable future. Naruto said. Where are we? Peggy asked after she sat down on the sofa, her frail body can't handle stresses, as it used to, especially the dizziness the teleportation caused. We're in a safe house in Switzerland. A friend of mine owns this place. Naruto replied. We got five hectares of open mountain terrain, we can use to condition your body after the procedure. I think that's more than enough. What exactly am I doing here? Sharon asked. You're the insurance. Naruto answered, but when he saw the questioning look of his audience face, he continued. If Peggy here dies for any reason during this procedure, I want someone to know that she decided to undergo this process under her own volition. I hate Fury to blow a gasket if the whole thing turns sour. Sharon would have liked to berate Naruto for doing something that might kill her aunt, but he was very candid that there's a chance the procedure won't work. He even admitted that he needed a weak test subject for the final part of his experiment. What are you going to do with my aunt? Sharon asked in concern. Now that's something I can't tell you. Only your aunt can know. Think of it as doctor-patient confidentiality. Naruto replied. I just brought you here, so you know where your aunt would be, be staying. He finished before holding onto Sharon's shoulder and disappearing. RAF Base Hospital, Alconbury, UK. September 9, 2007, 1545 H. Local. The pair suddenly appeared inside Sharon's car in the parking garage of the hospital, and Naruto handed over her phone. Try not to blurt out anything to Fury. You might trust him, but you can't trust the people around him. Naruto said before disappearing again. Sharon debated to herself about reporting to Fury. She's a loyal shield agent and not reporting an enhanced man claiming to be the Nine Tails, who took the first director of shield to be experimented on is not precisely the definition of loyal. But in the end, she decided just to let it play out, but she's going to try and contact Naruto again to get updates about her aunt. She was going to leave the hospital when she realized something. The RAF hospital is a high-security facility. Everyone needs to sign when going in or out. If she and Naruto appeared inside her car, did Naruto found a way to sign her out? Sharon immediately ran out of the car into the entrance of the hospital. When she got inside, the receptionist immediately took notice of her. Did you leave something behind Ms. Carter? The receptionist asks. Sharon confirmed that everyone saw her leave the hospital. She has no idea how Naruto did it, but it's certainly a cause for concern. That sent another thought into her head, so she casually lied to get back in. Yeah. I forgot to tell my aunt something. Sharon said while holding up her phone. She went through the whole process of signing her in again, before being allowed inside the hospital. They took her signature, a photo, a copy of her ID, and a biometric scan. All of it should be done when she went out too, so how the hell did Naruto fake her bio scan? Sharon paced down the hallway to her Aunt Peggy's room. She went inside without knocking and saw her Aunt Peggy sleeping on the bed. She silently closed the door, drew her gun, and approached the bed. When she's close enough, she aimed the weapon on top of the imposter's head. Who are you? Sharon asked dangerously. Her Aunt Peggy slowly morphed into Naruto, and gave her a wink before turning back into her aunt. The thing scared the shit out of her. It's like a scene straight out of a horror movie. Sharon immediately hightailed it out of the room if Naruto is capable of replacing everyone, who knows what would happen to her if she reports to Fury. John, Switzerland. September 9, 2007, 1646 H. Local.
Naruto appeared almost as suddenly as he left. Peggy was looking at him with a look of concern in her eyes. Where's Sharon? Peggy asked. I just brought her back to her car. Naruto answered while walking towards the couch. He sat on the opposite of the sofa and pulled out a large whiteboard and marker. Let me start by laying out the whole thing for you. I'm only going to say what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. Do you still accept the conditions? He asked seriously. Yes. Peggy answered with confidence, ignoring the sudden appearance of the massive whiteboard. Okay. First of all, I left a decoy in your room that will die three months from now. We need you to be entirely out of the picture so we can maximize the surprise during the counteroffensive. Naruto explained while writing it a condensed version on the whiteboard. Secondly, if Coulson doesn't find Cap in two years, I'm going to get him myself. Why can you just do it now? Peggy interjected. Because I'm still fixing some stuff before I can find him, and we need the time for you to condition your body. When the captain is found, we need you to be ready for anything before revealing you to the world. Naruto answered. Thirdly, we can't continue with the procedure until we strengthen your body for at least a month. I'm going to visit you every day and leave ready-to-eat meals and three bottles of nutrient shake that you need to finish every day. When we start the restoration process, your body's going to need a whole lot of nutrients. We need your body to stock up as much as it can. He said while placing a 500 milliliters tumbler. Fourth. During the restoration, we're going to hook you up to a dialysis machine. Each cell of your body would either rejuvenate or be replaced. Either way, it's going to flood your body with toxins. That's second to the most dangerous part, because of the shock of the toxins in your body might cause a systemic collapse of your organs. Second, if systemic organ collapse is bad, what could be worse than that? Peggy inquired with a raised eyebrow. Well, that's the last part. While the rejuvenation is happening, we need your soul and body to adapt to it. My soul? Yes, your soul. Naruto confirmed. Your soul aged with your body. Body. If it suddenly inhabited a body not suited to it, there are going to be some complications. The solution for that is the most problematic danger we would encounter. He said while drawing a human body. Every one of us has chakra. The combination of energy from the body and soul. It's stored inside the body as chakra reserves and moves around through a chakra network. Are you with me so far? Peggy nodded, although she doesn't honestly believe what he's saying. Most people minuscule chakra reserves and atrophied chakra network due to lack of use through dozens or hundreds of generations. It's just enough to keep someone alive. We can't do shit to reverse any of that completely. But what I can do is to make your reserve a tad larger, increase your chakra regeneration, and reinforce your chakra network. That won't be enough to make you do something like this. He created a ball of fire in his hands. Or this. He now suddenly multiplied into three. Or any other stuff I could do. But what it would do is controlled bleeding of chakra into your body. That would make you stronger faster, and more resilient, basically just like Captain Rogers. The downside is that one small mistake on my part could cause your body to explode. Do you get it? Peggy sat there frozen. She started skeptical about the whole chakra argument, but Naruto's demonstration quickly made her a believer. If chakra is indeed real, how did it get lost slowly over time, and is chakra that versatile? I'm just going to assume you got it, and continue. Naruto declared. I'm first going to remove your soul temporarily from your body. Peggy immediately became alarmed by what she heard, but Naruto immediately placated her. Don't worry about that part, there's nothing that could go wrong there. Next, I'm going to call upon the king of hell to store your soul tempor temporarily. 
again don't be alarmed. The king of hell would then restore your body to its peak form for your age before your soul is returned. That would exponentially increase the chance of everything going well. Now we get to the hard part. Peggy just gave up questioning stuff and is having a mini existential crisis. If saying that summoning king of hell is not something to worry about, then nothing means anything in more. I'm going to do a series of techniques that will repeatedly strip away anything problematic. A muscle cell not performing enough? That would be activated. Dying nerve cell? Destroyed and replaced. It would be killing you each cycle since it would be replacing a large number of your cells every time. The process would continue until we reach a physical peak. At the same time, I'm going to make the changes to your chakra system we talked about to help your soul adapt. When it's all said and done, you'll come out of it a little weak, but rejuvenated. It should take two years for you to adapt and another year for me to teach you stuff. Your old fighting style wouldn't work with your new body. It's like an amateur driver is suddenly placed inside an F1 car. Naruto finally ended his explanation. I have two questions if you wouldn't mind answering. Depends on the question. How did you come up with the procedure, and why are you doing this? The real reason. I guess that's fair. Naruto said with a sigh. The procedure is a combination of some things I thought might work. I started testing a lot of stuff for plants. I then moved up to a mouse, a cat, a pig, then a chimpanzee. Don't ask how I got any of those. Then I finally moved up to human test subjects. He could see Peggy's reaction, but he just continued. When I do my mercenary job, I take one or two guys that wouldn't be missed. Things quickly got messy after that. I have no idea why but doing chakra enhancements without step-by-step -step preparation turns humans into a human bomb with each cell individually exploded. Peggy paled, hearing the possible side effect of the procedure. As for the second thing. My girlfriend has her ability to have kids taken from her, and I want to give it back to her. I'm not doing this for me. Even if I know that down the line we will split up. I'll still do it. Peggy thought hard about what Naruto said and started to connect stuff. You're in a relationship with the widow. Peggy stated with confidence. Naruto gave her a full-bellied laugh. Damn. You're really smart. Naruto exclaimed while wiping a tear from his eye. Anyway. Are you ready to start? St. Luke's Church, London, UK. November 28th. 2007, 1100 H local. Naruto is leaning on the railings of the choir loft, looking over the whole ceremony making sure nothing would be missed. He's wearing an all-black suit partnered black leather shoes and aviator-style shades. Peggy Carter died eight days ago, and her will stated that she would like her funeral to happen in this church. The reason he's attending is that Natasha wanted to join the funeral, so he came with her. He had to try hard not to laugh at the whole thing since he knows that Peggy's alive and well. He almost lost it when Sharon started crying while giving her eulogy. Actually more than well, she's excellent. The procedure went off without a hitch and she's already able to move around without assistance, unlike the first few days where she would regularly trip over nothing since her mind is still adapting to her body. Aside from that, Naruto can't believe how beautiful she looks. He finally understood why the captain fell head over heels for her. If he didn't genuinely believe that Natasha is more beautiful than Peggy, she might have been mesmerized by her too. Naruto sighed when he thought about what he would need to do in the following weeks. He needs to intercept all the files of Peggy's death certificate to make it easier for her to return to society. The question is how he would do that while maintaining the cover that she's dead. When the funeral ended and Peggy's body was carried out of the church to bring to the cemetery, Natasha looked at him and gestured that she would talk to some people for a while. Naruto just nodded and gestured that he would just wait where he would be there waiting. 
Naruto didn't stay there alone for long when he heard three sets of footsteps from behind him until one by one, the three reached the railings. Barton positioned himself on the left, Fury on his right, while Coulson is on the other side of Fury. All of them are wearing black suits except for Fury, who's still wearing his black coat. What the hell one eye, you didn't even change into a suit. Naruto said, looking at Fury. Fury's eyebrow started twitching. I'm still wearing black, aren't I? Fury defended. Whatever you say, man. Naruto said dismissively before looking at Barton. How'd you like your bow? You couldn't leave a single note on how to use the thing. I almost destroyed the field before I figured out how to use it. Clint exclaimed while keeping his voice level low. Clint took a month to figure out how to use the bow. Of course, he isn't only studying the bow since he has a family to think about. He almost surrendered in ever using that particular bow again when he cracked it. The power of the bow depends on how far you pull the string back and how long you hold it. The power raises exponentially, starting from a quarter pull all the way to full draw. The same goes for the draw time. The weakest one would be from zero to two seconds, and the power would rise exponentially from that until max power at ten seconds. Pulling the bow at quarter length to until two seconds would make the bow, the bow fire normally, but fully drawing the string at ten seconds would cause the arrow to have the same force as a javelin missile. All the explosions aren't helping Laura's recovery since it stresses everyone, especially Laura and Cooper. Good thing Naruto left a cooler full of ready-to-eat meals that lasted them for a week and a half. He hated to admit it, but those meals are one of the best things he ever had. Laura is still continuously bugging him to get Naruto to bring more food. Where's the fun in that? Naruto retorted with a wide grin. Oh. Say hello to Lila for me. Say it's from Foxy. Clint's head rapidly turns towards Naruto. His eyes are wide and alarmed. You're fucking Foxy. Clint shouted. You didn't know? Naruto asked before laughing hard. You're telling me Lila never told you. That's gold. He forced out before laughing hard again. In the past eight months, Laura and Clint have been busier with Copper, which inevitably caused them to lose some time with Lila. Good thing that she started going to school, which took up most of her time. Another peculiar thing that happened though was Lila had a new imaginary friend she calls Foxy. She would play in her room with Foxy for hours. The reason Laura and Clint thought her playmate was imaginary, because they never saw her playmate, and the description of Lila's playmate changes every time. Clint is seriously considering placing cameras with motion detectors all over the house, particularly in Lila's room. Fury interjected before Naruto could blow Clint's gasket. What are you doing here? Fury asked. Natasha wanted to come, so I came with her. A whole lot cheaper than riding a plane. Naruto replied. No plan or business? Fury continued the questioning. Nah. Just pleasure. I wanted to tour London with NAT. I was alone when I first came around here. Naruto answered. Are you any closer to finding the capsicle? He asked Coulson. I'm nowhere close. I just narrowed down the crash site to a 100 kilometers radius, but it landed on an area with a lot of unstable ice that's continuously shifting. Coulson confessed. If you don't find it in three years, I'm stepping in. N Naruto said. The guy's in the ice for too long. Coulson was going to argue, but they heard footsteps coming up the stairs. The trio turned around and saw Alexander Pierce exiting the steps. Nick. What the hell are you doing hanging around here? Pierce asked. And who's the new guy? Naruto turned around, revealing a face similar to Sasuke with blonde hair. The sudden change surprised the trio but managed to hide it. 
Good noon, Secretary Pierce. What a pleasure to meet someone like you. I'm Nathan Umber. My father wanted me to pay respect to the woman that saved her life. Naruto smoothly lied with a British accent while extending his hand. Apparently, these guys. He motioned towards the trio. Thought I was some kind of security threat. A pleasure to meet a fan. Pierce replied while shaking Naruto's hands. Would you mind leaving for a while? I need to discuss something with my associate here. National security and all that stuff. You understand. He requested. No problem, sir. Naruto said before looking back at the trio, who's using all their will to stop dropping their jaws. Gentlemen. He greeted before leaving. Pierce waited for Naruto to leave the choir loft altogether before looking back at Fury. I heard you're starting up another search for the captain. What's that all about? Pierce asked. We have a new promising lead that significantly narrows down the area. Fury lied. If that's the case, I want a report on it. Pierce ordered with authority. I'm assuming Coulson is leading the search, so I want Sitwell helping him. That might speed up the whole thing. He finished before walking away, not giving Fury time to veto it. When Pierce was gone, Fury gave Coulson an order. Make sure Sitwell doesn't lay a hand on the captain when you find him. Coulson just gave Fury a nod. What nobody saw was black characters crawling up the hand Pierce used to shake hands with Naruto until it reached his nape before disappearing. That particular Fuin script is an eavesdropping seal and an Horatian seal combined. Chapter 39, Turned into Stone Fayetteville, North Carolina January 20, 2008, 1900 H. Local Fayetteville is a medium-sized city with a population not reaching 200,000. It's considered a military town due to its proximity to the U.S. Army installation, Fort Bragg. Many trainees and soldiers visit the town to unwind or celebrate when they get time offs. The bars are particularly popular with the soldiers as expected. Tonight is no different than any other night. A particular bar near the edges of the city is a favorite of some of the rowdier clientele. It has a good music, good atmosphere, good drinks, and good food. The perfect place to enjoy what little time off a soldier has. Everyone inside the bar is enjoying themselves, drinking, singing, dancing, chatting, everyone except one. A lone man sitting on the edge of the bar is drinking his way through a bottle of bourbon. The weird thing though, is that everyone is going out of their way to avoid the man. His name is Eric Stevens. The Lost Prince of Wakanda. He's a 6 feet 0 inches, 24 years old, muscularly built, African-American man with short black hair and black eyes. The man can be described with one word, tenacity. His whole life is based on his father's ideals. The night his father died, he discovered his ancestry the ancestry of the most powerful civilization to ever exist. Reading his father's journal left an impression on him, the marginalization of his people, the injustices, the slavery, the oppression. He understands everything his father wanted to do. Use the power of Wakanda to change the world order. It's time for Wakanda to rule the world as it should be. Eric planned out his whole life to eventually be the king of Wakanda. He studied hard and fast-tracked himself to college. After he graduated with honors at MIT, he joined the U.S. Navy until he eventually joined the Navy SEALs and assigned to the renowned Team 6. Eric had been able to complete 41 missions in the short span of two years and racking up 56 kill counts causing him to earn the fear and respect of his comrades. All his kills are marked into his body using the traditional crocodile scarification. His accomplishments finally led him into being transferred to the Joint Special Operations Command, or JSOC a week ago, which is based in Fort Bragg. The reputation he earned caused people to avoid him as much as possible, 
That's why he's sitting alone and isolated inside the crowded bar. Eric was on his sixth glass of bourbon when a blonde man wearing a burnt orange jacket sat next to him, causing the bar to quiet down in surprise. He studied the man for a moment, assessing if he's a threat. The man's posture is relaxed, which is opposite to what Eric's instincts are telling him. There's an underlying aura that could only be observed in war veterans, but the man looks younger than 25. The dichotomy of the man's presence caused Eric to increase his vigilance. The blonde man sat there for a while before signaling the bartender. Shot glass, a bottle of Everclear, and the largest serving of cheesy fries you have. Add as much cheese as you can. Serve everything at once. The man ordered while sliding $200 to the bartender. When the customers heard the man finally order, they slowly regained their energy until everything returned to normal. The bartender quickly fulfilled the order without questioning the man for his drink choices. It's not his job to babysit customers. The man's order was served in under five minutes. The large tip he gave must have motivated the staff enough to deliver the order quickly. Damn. That hits the spot. The man said after taking a bite of fries and taking a swig of Everclear. He then looked towards Eric and slid the fries closer. You want one? Eric just grunted in negative. He still can't figure out the man's agenda and is hanging back just to observe him. You know you should use your words, Lieutenant Stevens. Eric's alert level increased when he heard his name. You might turn into an emo duck-haired bastard when you just keep on grunting. Eric just kept on eyeing him, not falling for any of the man's provocation. The man just kept on eating and drinking, not paying attention to Eric. There's more to life than killing people and being the best. You won't be able to enjoy life if you keep living the way you are now. The man somehow finished the whole bucket of fries and a bottle of Everclear in the short amount of time he sat there. Follow me. You're going to want to hear what I'm going go to say. The man said before standing up and walking out the front door. Eric debated to himself if he should follow. The man clearly knows who he is and what he does. From everything he gathered from the short meeting, the man may come from the CIA, NSA, Homeland, or any other agency out there. With nothing to lose, he got up his seat and left $50 on the table. He walked out of the door and saw the man walking inside a small park a block away from them. When Eric got inside the park, he saw the man sitting on a bench. Bench. He walked over and sat on the opposite side of it. Before we start, I think it's best if I introduce myself since I know everything about you already. You can call me Naruto. I do not work for any government or organization. I'm just a lone wolf here to extend you an offer. Naruto said while holding a folder in his hands. Enough with all that bullshit. Just say your piece. Eric urged, nervous when he heard Naruto emphasize the word everything. I want you to quit the military and work for me. I'll send you to deal with all the worst scumbags in the world and, at the same time, help people held down by the scumbags. You're going to do all these things alone or with me. Naruto laid out his offer. The only catch is you could only do one mission a month. The mission could last half a day or one month, but you could only do one. Why the hell would I want to do that? I've just been transferred to JSOC. I could do all that shit while in there. Eric retorted, seeing no point in accepting the man's offer. Well, aside from the generous pay that might go as high as a million dollars for each mission. Naruto reached inside his pocket and revealed a single Kamoyo bead. I'll give you one of these things for every two missions. That way, you could have a complete working set by two years, Prince Njidaka. Eric immediately noticed the Kamoyo bead when he saw it even though the only one he ever saw was his father's, and that won't work for him since it's already coded to his father's DNA. The name Judaka, though, that's what alarmed him. The only way Naruto could know that name was if he read his father's journal, 
which is in a safety deposit box. Eric drew a knife from his back and placed it on Naruto's throat. Who are you? Eric asked in a dangerous tone, but Naruto just remained calm. I told you I'm Naruto. Are you deaf or something? Don't play with me, motherfucker. I'm going to fucking slit your throat. Eric threatened, forcing the blade deeper to Naruto's throat. Don't say it. Just do it. Naruto said with a wide grin. Eric, who's already on edge, pulled back his knife and plunged it to Naruto's brain through his jaw, but to his surprise, the blade bent. He felt a tingling sensation running up his arm, similar to when you hit a metal bat at the pole. You done yet? Naruto asked disinterestedly. I think I introduced myself with the wrong name. He said while fixing his jacket. My name is really Naruto, but I'm more famous as Nine Tails. Naruto saw the same shocked expressions he saw with other people when he reveals his alias. So, you want to accept the job? He finally asked while handing over the folder. Eric hesitantly took the folder and opened it. He saw a dossier of a British man. His shock is slowly turning into a justified rage as he reads through it. The fucker is one of the so-called blood diamond warlords. People who are controlling the African diamond trade. These are the people he wanted to target, but can't do inside the military. When Eric got trough the folder, he closed it and looked at Naruto. Give me one week to process my exit papers. Eric said with finality. Natasha's Safe House, New York. March 30th, 2008, 1830H Local. Naruto has been assigned again to cook dinner. Natasha and Jessica had unanimously agreed to let Naruto cook as much as possible since his cooking is to die for. It's been already a little over nine months since Jessica joined there with arrangement. A month ago, when the couple finally convinced Jessica to move into the safe house slash apartment. The decision was made since Natasha and Naruto are gone half of the time, and Jessica has been staying with them whenever one of them is present. There's just no point for Jessica to live in her apartment if she lives with them half of the time. Time. Jessica relented after Naruto used his puppy dog eyes at full power. The whole thing just added to Jessica's hypothesis that they are one crazy couple. It's one thing to have a threesome arrangement with the two but another for her to be their roommate. Natasha and Jessica became close friends, almost as much as Natasha is to Laura. They've been able to talk to each other about some personal matters, which was a massive development for Jessica. Another huge accomplishment was they were able to convince Jessica to go back to college in the following semester. Slowly but surely, the couple was able to pull Jessica out of her depression. Natasha and Jessica were chatting on the kitchen island while watching Naruto chopping some greens when they noticed he suddenly stopped mid-chop. Sonts, my son. Naruto. Natasha called in worry, but Naruto just remained standing still. Natasha and Jessica looked at each other, silently communicating about what they should do next. The pair know that Naruto is not exactly normal. Jessica is reminded of Naruto's power every time Natasha tells censored stories of Naruto's exploits, although she still can't connect the overactive Naruto to a sociopathic killer. The duo walked around the island and slowly approached Naruto from both sides. They were about an arm's reach away from him, when he suddenly dropped down to his knees and shouted in pain. Natasha and Jessica took a step back in surprise. This is the first time both of them saw him in any kind of real pain. Natasha saw him take a grenade launcher head-on and be on fire with the hottest flame in existence without even showing an ounce of pain. Jessica, for her part, had punched Naruto full swing a lot of times, usually after a corny prank, and only acted in pain while laughing his hearts out. The pair don't know what to do. Every time they try to get closer to him, a small repulsive force pushes them back. That's when they saw him slowly turning to stone from the ground up. Natasha is practically sobbing at this point. 
Jessica decided it's more useful to hold on to Natasha, but tears are also streaming down her eyes. Naruto's screams of anguish are just driving the point of how helpless they currently are. When the solidification reached his hips, Naruto pushed down his whimpers and started to do some hand signs slowly. He was able to push his hands towards the ground, and smoke filled the room. Natasha was still whimpering in Jessica's arms when the smoke finally cleared. The first thing they saw was a solidified Naruto on his, and his palms pressed on the floor. The next thing they saw are nine one-foot-tall creatures surrounding Naruto. Each of them are different from each other. In a clockwise direction starting from Naruto's back, a brown raccoon with blue marks running around its body, a two-tailed cat made of blue flames with black marks running around its body, a three-tailed spiked turtle with a gray carapace and one eye, a four-tentacled ape with green skin and red fur, a five-tailed white horse with the head of a dolphin, a six-tailed slug, a six-winged blue and green beetle with a green tail, a brown minotaur with its lower body turned into an octopus and finally an orange fox with nine tails. That's when Natasha remembered one of Naruto's stories about the nine creatures of pure chakra that can destroy the world. Each of them are placed inside a human to be a weapon. She recognized Kurama, the nine-tailed fox, as the monster sealed inside him, but what are the other Bijou doing here? The other Bijou should be left behind in the elemental nations, but it looks like Naruto brought them with him. Stupid kit. Kurama said in a whisper. Go to the mates, Kurama. We're going to try and stabilize the nature chakra. The Minotaur Octopus Hybrid said. Kurama nodded to Giyuki's suggestion and walked over to the girls. Follow me. Kurama said to Natasha and Jessica before walking towards the sofa set and sitting on top of the center table. Jessica, being the one more composed of the two, led Natasha towards the living room. She also recognized the fox as Kurama in Naruto's stories. There's nothing else they could do, so why not follow the all-powerful demon fox? Sit down. Kurama ordered. Natasha and Jessica sat down on the sofa in front of him. Both of them still red-eyed from their crying, especially Natasha, but she finally calmed a little. Here's the thing. Naruto did something stupid as you might expect, but he would be fine. Don't worry. How could I not worry? He turned into a fucking stone. Natasha exclaimed, finally releasing some of her built-up tension. That's nothing. If he were still mortal, that would be a problem. Kurama offhandedly announced, not realizing what he said. A ball of sand suddenly hit the back of his head, and he turned around. What the hell, Shikaku? You're not supposed to tell them about that, dumb fox. The brown raccoon, now named Shikaku, said. Kurum suddenly has a deer caught in the headlight look, and looked back at the two girls. Can you just forget about what I said? Kurama weakly requested. Natasha finally realized Naruto's big secret, why it feels like sometimes Naruto pulls back in the relationship. At first, she thought it was because of his insecurities as a child, but now the truth is revealed. How is he immortal? Natasha asked in a dangerous whisper. The Minotaur Octopus hybrid decided to join take over the conversation, before Kurama can somehow screw it up more. Hello. I'm Gyuki. The Eight-Tailed Ox. I think I'm better suited to answer that question. Gyuki said. Naruto's immortality is a complicated situation that occurred due to multiple unlikely events coming together, but a simple phrase, phrase can explain it, he became immortal when he became a god. He dropped the bomb without any preamble. Natasha and Jessica's mind froze hearing Gyuki's explanation goofy, but sociopathic Naruto is a god? Your definition of a god is a little different than ours. With our definition, we are basically gods ourselves. Kurama explained, seeing the gears running through the ladies' minds. Natasha slightly calmed down enough after hearing Kurama's explanation, and was able to focus on something more urgent. 
What happened to him? Natasha asked. When he first traveled the world, we noticed that the natural chakra pathways running across the planet were a little constipated. Without the nature chakra flowing freely across the earth, one of Naruto's abilities was sealed. His ability to control nature chakra allowed him to sense everyone in the world if he likes, and that's just one of its benefits. He also can't summon us without fixing the world's chakra network, without causing a disaster since the moment he summons us, we would connect to the chakra network. Gyuki explained. So he finally fixed it since he summoned you guys, but why did he turn into stone? Jessica asked. Pure nature chakra would cause any human to turn into stone. That's why he was pushing you two away. Karama explained, finally answering the question of why they can't get close to him. He continuously pumped his chakra into the world to start its motion. When he succeeded in letting nature chakra flow through the world freely, a burst of nature chakra flowed out of the hot zones where Naruto's clones are facilitating the flow. Without any intervention, it would cause disaster in those areas. That's why his clones decided to absorb all of it into their body. The problem occurred when one by one, clones filled with nature chakra popped, sending it directly to Naruto, who's unprepared with the sudden assault of foreign chakra. We tried to combat it with pushing demonic chakra or Yuki to his body, but that might cause significant harm to you too. That's why Naruto just decided to take the nature chakra. Karama finished. He summoned us to make sure we can manage to release him from the nature chakra's effects faster and to have someone explain the events to you. Yuki added. Natasha tried to file away all the information the two bijus told her but the number of stresses assaulting her mind right now is just too much to organize. Jessica saw Natasha slowly getting overwhelmed by the situation again, and she decided to take over. When will he get out of that? Jessica asked while pointing at Naruto. A day at most. Tomorrow morning the earliest. Gyuki answered. All right. Thank you. I'll just take Nat to the room. We probably can't eat after all this. Jessica replied before standing up and leading Natasha to the bedroom. Of course. We'll handle cleaning up the mess here. Have a good night. Gyuki said before Jessica could close the door. Kamar Taj, Kathmandu, Nepal. March 31st, 2008, 0500H local. The Ancient One was watching over the morning practices, when a wave of energy washed over the world. It was so powerful that even the apprentices took notice. Mordo immediately ran over to her side with worry in his eyes. His unbending beliefs about sorcery are now slightly tempered. The Ancient One's decision to let him read her journals and make him understand that rules are sometimes meant to be broken was enough to prevent Mordo's desertion in the future. Master. What should we do? Mordo asked the Ancient One. The Ancient One remained silent, trying to think about what could cause the surge of power. It took her honing her senses and focusing down on the Earth before she identified what happened. The Earth's chakra network is restored. The Ancient One stated. How? I thought Sorcerer Supreme Agamotto had invariably closed off the network when he created the eye. Mordo asked, asked. When Agamotto forged his ultimate weapon to battle Dormammu, he had to utilize all of the power of the world to create a vessel that could control an infinity stone. He was, of course, successful, but it caused the Earth's chakra to deplete, causing it to stagnate. The fox healed the world. The Ancient One said with certainty. There's no being strong enough that could kickstart the world's chakra circulation. We need to find him before the new year. Some things need to remain the same. She said with urgency. Chapter 40, Early Surprise Natasha's Safe House, New York March 31st, 2008 0600H Local 
Jessica woke up alone in the bed. She remembered sleeping with Natasha in her arms. Natasha must have been drained because the moment she laid on the bed, she went straight to sleep. Jessica woke up intermittently throughout the night, making sure that Nat's okay, and the creatures of mass destruction haven't decided to go into the room. The feeling of sleeping so close to something that could wipe out all life on Earth is really disconcerting. Jessica got out of the bed, still wearing what she wore yesterday, and got out of the bedroom. She saw Natasha sitting on the couch, staring intently on Naruto's figure being surrounded by the puppy-sized bijou. How long have you been awake? Jessica asked when she sat down next to Natasha. Not long. Maybe an hour. Natasha answered, still gazing at Naruto. Thanks for being with me, Jess. She continued while looking at Jessica. No problem. That's what friends with benefits do. Jessica said, trying to put some levity on the situation. It seemed to work since Natasha let out a small chuckle. Aren't you going to work today? She asked. Right. I should probably call Fury. Natasha replied, not realizing she said the name of her boss out loud, although Jessica do doesn't seem to give it any importance. Nat picked up her phone from the center table and dialed a number. A few moments later, Natasha spoke. Boss. I'm not going to be able to get in today. Maybe tomorrow too. Give me a reason, Romanoff. I can't just put in nothing. Fury replied from the other end of the line. It's personal. Okay. That's what I'll put in. Fury said while typing it into the leave request form. A small burst of static was heard after Fury pushed a button on his phone. This sound indicated to both him and Natasha that no one would eavesdrop on the conversation. Now. Tell me what happened. He ordered. Natasha debated to herself whether she should answer or not. In the end, she decided to do something in the middle. Naruto did something stupid last night that incapacitated him for a bit. Apparently, he stopped a series of disasters previous night, and that wore him out. I'm just going to shoot him a few times today to warn him not to do something like that again without telling me. Natasha explained, using only half-truths. Huh. Who knew something could take him down? Fury mused, filing it away for future use. Natasha quickly understood Fury's words, but she doesn't care right now. And even if they find a way to take him down, it won't last for long because of the whole immortality thing. I'll call you tomorrow, boss if I'll be able to come in. Natasha informed Fury before closing the phone and tossing it. Jessica noticed Natasha tensing before tossing her phone away. She decided to throw caution into the wind and ask her question. Your boss didn't take the news well. No. He took it a little too well. He probably is already planning a whole bunch of stuff that can take down Naruto in the future. Natasha said with more bite than she wants to let out. Damn. He's cold. Jessica exclaimed. That's his job. He's just really good at it. Natasha stated. Jessica nodded and decided to look around the apartment. She was surprised that it looked clean especially the kitchen where Naruto was cooking. Who knew the Bijus knew how to clean? It's been three long hours of waiting. Jessica decided to take out some breakfast for both of them, when she started to get hungry a while back, but the pair didn't move away from the couch as much as possible. Naruto's statue started to show some cracks that slowly gets larger and larger. The bright orange light is leaking through the cracks. Pieces of stone started falling off his body, making the light significantly brighter. Jessica and Natasha are already covering their eyes, only peeking through the gaps of their fingers. The light's intensity peaked before slowly dying down enough to look at Naruto directly. Naruto is covered by black overall with an orange circle at the abdomen, a jacket, 
and a pair of boots seemingly made of orange flames, and his whole body is glowing with orange light. His eyes are in that special mode he calls Shinigan. Slowly, the orange flames retreated into his abdomen, revealing Naruto as he was last night, wearing a white shirt, orange shorts, and flip-flops. Natasha seeing that the situation is finally defused, stood up from the couch, and decked Naruto hard on the face. Naruto can do nothing else, but take the hit since he didn't saw it coming. She grabbed him by the collar, and brought him close to her. You're not ever going to do something like that again. Natasha said with conviction before kissing him. She can't contain her emotions anymore and cried again on Naruto's arms. SHHH. SHHH. Everything's alright. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Naruto continued whispering to Natasha's ear until she finally, finally calmed down. Don't think you're in the clear yet. You have a lot of explaining to us. Natasha said while tilting her head towards Jessica. Naruto nodded, seeing no other choice in the situation. He took a moment to observe his surroundings, particularly the Bijou. He noticed they're a little nervous, especially Karama. That's something he needs to talk with them for another time. Naruto called the Bijou back into him, seeing no point in letting them out for an extended time for now. He walked back towards the living room and gave Jessica a nod and a smile. Naruto sat on the armchair so he could create an atmosphere that the ladies could use to ask questions freely. Natasha understood Naruto's intentions and sat on the sofa next to Jessica. What do you guys want to know? Naruto asked. I want to know what happened yesterday. Natasha replied plainly. Didn't Karama explained it? Naruto inquired, genuinely confused. He did, but we want it to come from you. Jessica answered. Naruto gathered his thoughts and tried to make an easily understandable explanation of the what's, how's, and why's. Every living being produces chakra inside its body. From the smallest of ants to the largest of trees, each and every one of them generates chakra. When chakra is created while the container is full, the excess is released to the environment. In our world, the first usable chakra produced by humans manifested in the Atsutsuki brothers. In this world, however, I have no idea who first gave humans chakra. But all I know is that it's been left alone for so many generations that it slowly atrophied, leaving just enough to keep a person alive. Naruto explained. So, like the appendix. Jessica interjected. Yeah. Exactly that. Naruto agreed. The excess chakra released to the environment is transferred towards the earth, which naturally transforms into nature chakra. Natural chakra networks or ley lines are produced around the world, connecting hotspots, hotspots to each other, making sure that nature chakra across the globe remains equal. I noticed when I arrived is that there is no flow of nature chakra anywhere. Pockets of it are forming everywhere, only helping the locale where they are produced. That's why when I traveled, I left clones of myself in these places to force a flow to happen, to kickstart the whole thing, and regain flow. Naruto said. What are you talking about? Jessica asked. Haven't I showed you? Naruto created a single clone when he saw Jessica shake her head no. What the hell? So you just have copies of you running around? Yeah, but I mostly use them to scout or do boring stuff. Naruto replied. As I was saying, my clones started mixing my chakra with these pools so they can be controlled to flow outside of it. It took three years of slow progress to achieve the flow that is needed. What I didn't expect is the massive overflow of nature chakra streaming out of the hotspots. If any amount of undiluted nature chakra made contact with a human, they would immediately turn into stone. That's why the clones decided to absorb all of it, which eventually transferred all to me. I had no time to control the nature chakra properly inside me, so I turned into stone. 
Why didn't you say anything about the other bijous inside you? Natasha asked in a professional tone. Naruto had enough sense to look ashamed. Keeping that a secret is a terrible move, but there's no real point in revealing that until there's something to say like when I can summon them. It just so happens it coincided with the accident. Naruto explained. Those guys are massive chakra beasts. With no proper chakra network in place, the local hotspot would quickly overload with chakra that comes out from them. He continued when he saw the confused expressions the girls adopted. Tell me the truth. Natasha's expression turned more intense, intense, pinning Naruto with a hard glare before asking the big question. Why didn't you tell me you're an immortal? Naruto finally understood why the bijus were so tense. They probably accidentally revealed his condition, most probably Karama. He decided it's best to be honest in this situation. Because I didn't want us to break up. Naruto confessed. Natasha was taken aback by Naruto's answer. She expected him to give an excuse or merely not answer the question. Why would you think that? Natasha asked, not understanding how Naruto could think something like that. It's because that's what a reasonable person would do. Naruto said before looking at Jessica. Back me up here. Jessica went wide-eyed when she was suddenly included in the conversation. Hey, hey, hey. I'm not part of any of this. Jessica asserted while raising her hands. But he's right. She continued while looking at Natasha. I just want for the bubble to last as long as possible. Naruto admitted while unconsciously flashing his puppy dog eyes. Natasha's righteous anger slowly ebbed away, but she had to know one last question. Were you ever going to tell me? Natasha asked. Yes. Around three years from now. Naruto replied. Why? What's happening in three years? Naruto sighed and stood up, pacing back and forth in front of the couch. Remember when I asked for a safe house? Naruto asked. Yeah. Something about a secret you'll show in three to five years. Natasha answered, remembering that particular morning. I think it's best if I show you. Naruto said, offering a hand to Natasha, who quickly took it. He then extended another hand to Jessica, who looked surprised. What? You think I'll just leave you here? Jessica flashed a shy smile before taking Naruto's hand before they su suddenly vanished. John, Switzerland. March 31st, 2008, 1600 H local. The trio appeared in the middle of the living room. Jessica saw the beautiful scenery outside the window after her lightheadedness died down. She saw the mountain ranges, trees, and grass-filled valleys. Where are we? Jessica asked. Switzerland. A safe house near John. Natasha answered. She took her turn of looking around and noticed that the place looks lived on, a sweater on the couch, boots by the door, and jackets hanging on the coat rack. What Natasha noticed though, was every item she saw are for women. The smell of perfume in the air only served to support her observation. Naruto. Are you hiding a woman here? Yep. Naruto replied with a bright smile, while shaking off the feeling that he forgot something important. A mistress? Natasha asked. Don't we need to be married for that to happen? Naruto asked, genuinely confused. Something from the back of his mind is screaming at him that he forgot something important. Naruto. Natasha said, threateningly. Naruto knew he's in trouble when he heard Natasha's tone, but he has no idea why. Good thing, the universe decided to throw him a bone, but in the worst way possible. Naruto? Nat. What are you doing here? And what is Jones doing here? Sharon exclaimed when she decided to check out the ruckus in the living room. 
Damn. I knew I forgot something. Naruto whispered to himself. Jessica is standing on the sidelines, watching the scenario unfold, thoroughly enjoying the play-by-play. -play. Somehow. Natasha looked shocked, seeing Sharon in her safe house. She quickly turned her head towards Naruto. You're having an affair with Sharon. Natasha exclaimed. Jessica wanted to say that she's been doing it with the both of them. Them. So that's not as big a deal as it should be but decided just to shut up and enjoy the whole thing. What? No. Naruto cried out. You're dating Naruto. The Nine Tails. Sharon questioned Natasha. Natasha quickly believed in Naruto's assertion, so she focused on Sharon. She quickly needs to make sense of the whole situation. The roller coaster of emotions she's been experiencing since last night is just too much. Let's calm down and discuss things without shouting at each other. We can just shoot Naruto after everything. Is that acceptable? Natasha proposed, attempting to create some semblance of order. Sharon acknowledged Natasha's attempt and nodded. Yes. I'm dating Naruto. We've been together for a little over a year. Natasha answered. What are you doing here? I shouldn't be the one to answer that question. Sharon stated before looking at Naruto. He should be the one to answer that. Natasha looked at Naruto, urging him to answer. The answer would come through the door in three, two, one. Naruto counted down. When he reached zero, the front door opened, revealing a woman. Are we having a party? The woman asked with a thick British accent. She's wearing red, white, and blue winter running outfit. Natasha took a hot minute before she recognized the woman. She only identified her after scanning through her memories of the S.H.I.E.L.D. archives and history. Peggy Carter? Natasha said in a whisper. Jessica recognized the name went wide-eyed. Peggy Carter is a war hero. One of the most decorated women in the military and pivotal to Hydra's downfall. There's only one catch, though. I thought she's like 90 years old and, more importantly, dead. Jessica remarked. The too young and mobile Peggy Carter removed her boots and coat, coat, making herself more comfortable. For your information, I'm only 87 years old. Peggy retorted. And all of this is the fault of our blonde-haired friend. He offered me a chance that I almost refused. She explained. What? Make you younger? Jessica asked half sarcastically. Yes. That's exactly what he offered. Peggy answered. That and making me a super soldier. She added. Natasha thought quickly about why she would accept Naruto's offer. The last report on her reported that she's waiting for her eventual end, wanting to be together with her lost love. A tragic love story if anyone wrote about it. That's when she remembered who her lost love is. You know. You know the cap's still alive. Natasha states with confidence. Jessica, being the only one not in the know, was surprised for another time today. Captain America is still alive. Don't tell me he's here too. Jessica exclaimed before looking at Naruto. Can't you just drop everything at once? Hey. That's not on me. It's not my fault he managed to stay alive being half buried in snow. Naruto stated. Peggy, Sharon, and Natasha managed to pick up Naruto's strange use of words. The trio looked at each other and silently communicated before looking back to Naruto. Naruto. How did you know he's half buried in the snow? Peggy asked, all too sweetly. Naruto realized his mistake. When they hirishined to Switzerland, Naruto decided to use his newly unlocked ability to find Captain Rogers. When he determined his location, he mentally sent a command to his clones mark the plane. 
The whole thing lasted only lasted for 15 minutes. Kamui sure is one hell of a cheat. He didn't intend for Peggy to be clued in that he knows where the captain is. I guessed. Naruto lied badly. Natasha hazily remembered Karama's explanation last night. Something about finding anyone on the planet. When did you find him? Natasha asked, ignoring Naruto's blatant lie. She doesn't understand how Naruto could act excellently, but, at the same time, lying poorly. Twenty minutes ago. Naruto admitted. But we agreed I'll only get him when, when Coulson can't find him in two years. He reminded Peggy. Why's that again? Sharon asked. Because Peggy here needs to be ready to face any consequence the captain being alive might cause. Naruto explained. The spies understood Naruto's reasoning, mainly because they know Hydra is still active. Captain America would force Hydra's hand to do something drastic one way or another. Jessica decided to interject and circle back to one of the topics at hand and asked a question. So he decided to reverse your age, so you and Captain America have a chance to get together? That's sweet of Naruto, I guess. Jessica asked. Partially, but he did it mostly for Natasha. Peggy answered. He wants to create a procedure that can regenerate and heal any injuries and ailments. Natasha questioned why Naruto would make a regeneration procedure for her. The only reason she found was for what the red room to her. Tears of gratitude and joy fell from her eyes. She quickly turned and tackle hugged Naruto. Thank you. Natasha whispered continuously to his ear. Anything for you, Haim. Chapter 41, Drawing Parallels John, Switzerland March 31, 2008, 1645 H. Local Ahem. Naruto and Natasha snapped out of their moment when they heard someone clearing their throat. The pair looked towards the direction of the noise and saw Sharon with a sheepish expression. I hate to break up this obviously emotional moment, but I still want to know what Jones is doing here. Does, does everyone know about me? What the hell? Can't someone have a little bit of privacy? Jessica exclaimed, not appreciating the obvious invasion of privacy of some huge unknown government agency to her life. Not necessarily. I just know about you since I was one of your watchers when I was still a rookie. Maybe around two or three years ago. Sharon calmly replied. Jessica thought back two to three years ago. That's right before his then-live-in boyfriend Sterling Adams was murdered in Club Alias. Knowing some knowledge on how Nat's organization work, she thought back to everyone that she has minimal contact with but is in a great position to snoop into her life. Running through her memories, she remembers a neighbor on living at the end of the hallway that she occasionally exchanges pleasantries with. Fuck. You're the blonde nurse who's always wearing a ponytail. Jessica stated. Wow. You have a good memory. Sharon complimented her genuinely. You should think about joining S.H.I.E.L.D. You're going to kill it there. She suggested. Stop right there. Naruto shouted, still holding Natasha in his arms. You're not going to recruit her to join a spy agency that can't even find a whole enemy organization within their ranks. Who knows what they'll do to her when she gets in? He reasoned. Jessica was going to explode on Naruto for his overprotective behavior until she heard his reason. It looks like there's something more going in their group she isn't privy about. Sharon noticed that they're getting off topic again and decided to bring it back around. Can someone please explain why she's here? Sharon asked again. Natasha wanted to lie and say something about how Naruto and Jessica are close friends and she just got roped in, but Naruto answered faster than her, which he answered in the worst way possible. She, she lives with us or something like that. Naruto answered, 
not really knowing how to describe their living situation. And she joins for a threesome most of the time. Everybody reacted differently to Naruto's casual statement. Natasha facepalmed hard, expecting that kind of answer from Naruto, but she still can't believe the holes in his knowledge of essential social interaction cues. Peggy experienced another shock seeing an example of how different the current times are compared to her own. The surprise only lasted until she remembered that they're talking about Naruto, the guy who somehow makes everything weird. Sharon has the tamest reaction, only releasing a small cough. Being a young woman who lived in New York for a while, she already encountered a wide range of people, including people in open relationships. At the opposite side of the spectrum was Jessica's reaction. She was first shocked by Naruto's response until it slowly turned into embarrassment, which turned into anger. By that point, only one logical thing she could do. Jessica took one small step towards Naruto, wind up her arm, and punched him hard. Naruto saw the punch coming from a mile away. He started moving away from the blow, but Natasha grabbed hold of his body, preventing him from dodging without doing something drastic like forcing his way out. Naruto only has one choice left. Kamui. Naruto whispered to himself. Natasha and Jessica's arms went straight through Naruto, which shocked Natasha, Sharon, and Peggy. Jessica, on the other hand, is still on her embarrassment-fueled warpath. Fuck. Jessica shouted. You undo everything you're doing right now, and take the hit like a man. She continued. No way. Naruto said as he runs away. Get back here. Jessica roared as she followed Naruto through the house. Natasha, Sharon, and Peggy just watched the whole thing, unable to find the prop proper reaction they should show. Are you sure he's the one you want? Cause I can hook you up with someone else. Just say the word. Sharon offered, entirely serious. Natasha let out a sigh and dropped down on the sofa. Unfortunately. Natasha let out. Peggy and Sharon sat down on opposite sides of Natasha. They can hear Naruto and Jessica's voices reverberating around the house. Not to be a nosy or anything, but why did Naruto bring you here? It's my impression that he would only bring you here after Aunt Peggy's revealed. Sharon asked. Natasha expected the question to come at any moment. Actually, she expected it to come before the whole Jessica thing, that's why she already knew what she was going to answer. I can't tell you much about what happened, but I can say that I found out something about Naruto that led to this. Natasha explained. Although completely unsatisfied about the explanation, the Carters accepted Natasha's answer. They'll just have to figure out what happened through another way if they ever wanted to find out. Does Fury know about you being in a relationship? Sharon asked, thinking about how the Black Widow is one of his most effective pieces. Yeah. He knows about us. Natasha confirmed. He first wanted me to spy for him, but I threatened to quit if he forced me into it. He tried to do some other stuff like remote surveillance, but quickly gave up on that idea. Naruto has luck and skill on his side, capable of easily outmaneuvering even Fury. She continued with a small smile. Even if all that doesn't work, he's just so unpredictable that Fury would rather gouge out his eye than deal with him. Peggy let out a full-hearted laugh at Natasha's statement. Meeting Naruto every day for the past seven months has driven home some facts about him. Number one on that list is his unpredictability. After calming down from he laughing fit, Peggy asks a question she's dying to know the answer to. Are you going, are you going to do the procedure? Peggy asked. Yes. Natasha's answer was instantaneous. I don't know if I'll ever going to be a mother, but I want the chance. You should talk to him. Peggy advised. He loves you so much, and he's terrified of you leaving. When he told me why he's doing the regeneration procedure, he somehow thinks that you two are surely going to break up. 
she continued. Peggy's statement brought down a somber mood on the trio, but it didn't last long since Naruto suddenly phased through the wall and run straight towards them. The action surprised the ladies, especially after he phased through them too and out of the house through the wall. Seriously, N.A.T. You could do much better. Sharon quipped. Hong Kong, China. September 14, 2008, 2300 H local. Come in, Mr. Awesome, over Eric said to his mic. He's currently on the rooftop of an abandoned commercial building just outside the Victoria Harbor, staking out one of the Triad's warehouses. Eric has been doing work for Naruto for the past eight months. All of his missions involve human trafficking, and this one is no different. This time, a high-ranking triad official is going to oversee a shipment of newly acquired merchandise, which is a euphemism for slaves. The 300 or so girls the triad acquired are going to be shipped to different parts of the globe, surely to be used as disposable sex slaves. If the ship ever leaves port, they won't have another shot on severely crippling this part of their operation. Go ahead, Mr. Broody, over. Naruto's voice responded through the radio. Next time, I'll be the one to choose the code names, over. Eric replied, pissed about his boss's immature personality. You said that during the past three missions. What makes you think you're ever going to choose, over? Naruto retorted his cheery attitude could be hurt through the radio. Radio. Eric sighed in defeat. His fucking boss really enjoys messing with him, and he still has a little under a year and a half to go through. He's musing not sure if he can last that long without trying to kill him for all the good it will do. That's when a convoy of black SUVs rolled up the front of the warehouse, followed by three heavily guarded semis which drove through the gate. We have activity. Eric reported still surveilling the cars. The doors of the SUVs opened, and a total of 24 people disembarked, the most notable of which is a man in an Armani suit. I have visual on the target, over. You want to handle it, or should I? Naruto asked. Eric mulled it over. He knows he can take out everyone outside with the loadout he has, but he has no idea about how many more are inside the warehouse itself. He has four options on how to do this. One, he can take out the outside and let Naruto handle everyone on the inside. Option two is the opposite of that. Option three is that he wings it and drop everyone, and option four is to let Naruto handle all of it. The way Eric sees it, there's only one real option. I'll take them myself, over. Eric radioed out immediately changing out his extended magazine AW-50 to his HK-416 as his primary weapon and strapped it around his body, leaving the AW-50 for later pickup if possible. Eric grabbed his Milker six-shot grenade launcher and jumped over the ledge, his rappel line bringing him back towards the building face. He runs down the side of the building, aimed his MGL towards the SUV caravan, and started unloading all six shots to the convoy. This caused a massive chain reaction of explosions, flipping over some SUVs and forming massive fireballs, effectively cutting off the main exit of the warehouse and killing more than half of the guards. Too bad, the main man is still alive and is retreating inside the warehouse through the side door. He tossed the grenade launcher when he reached the ground and sprinted towards the warehouse, ignoring the flames licking his skin and half-burnt bodies on the ground. Eric braced his back on the wall by the side of the door and took a peek, which was immediately answered with a hail of gunfire. He unhooked a grenade from his pack and tossed it inside. The moment the grenade exploded, he rushed inside, firing at everyone he sees. He fired some quick headshots to the downed men to make sure they're dead and continued forward. Eric stuck to the shadows, making sure that he's exposed as little as possible. The triad was heavily armed, but they're not as trained as their gear suggests. He cut through them like butter, making sure to count his kills along the way. He was just about to enter the warehouse proper when he heard gunfire and bullets whizzing by. 
Eric quickly found cover and hid himself. That's when he noticed the gunshot wound on his abdomen, uncomfortably close to his kidney. The bullet penetrated just below his bulletproof vest. Fuck. Eric said to himself. Need some help? Naruto offered through the radio. Shut up. I got this. Eric answered, not willing to give up. Eric changed his magazine and pulled down his goggles. He pulled out three tear gas canisters and three M18 smoke grenades. One by one, he pulled the pins and tossed it inside. He might lose visual of the enemy, but the enemy can't also see him, and that's what he needs. He hurried inside the room and fired at the general direction of foreign sounds, while making sure he's not staying at any one place. He also fired towards the guards that are on top of the railings running, running around the warehouse. His enemies are not entirely useless in the smoke though. Some shots still find its way to him, his vest taking most of the damage. It's just through sheer luck a bullet didn't find his head. The smoke slowly dispersed, revealing the massacre he brought to the triads. He's not taking any chances, though. He pulled out his sidearm and shot all the bodies through the head. Eric looked over every body, but he can't find the head honcho. Before he could pull his HK-416 though, he felt the familiar burning sensation of a bullet wound was felt in his legs. It seems your luck ran out, American. The triad leader said while pointing an AK towards him. Heh, but not before you though. Eric retorted with a small chuckle. The triad leader didn't have time to think about Eric's statement before a large cone-shaped piece of rock launched from the ground and impaled the leader. The rock pierced through his ass and exceeded his abdomen, pulling out his guts. The whole thing was not a clean kill since the leader tried to pull himself out of the rock before eventually succumbing to his injuries. Even Eric felt sorry about how the leader died. Eric heard someone dropping down behind him, so he turned around. This is one of your worst works. The whole thing is sloppy and loud. Not to mention the fact that you didn't think things through. Naruto commented. I think this is what would happen to you every time you let your ego take control. I could have taken him out. Eric replied weakly. And what's the point of it if you're dead? Naruto retorted while tossing Eric a small vial that he caught. Drink that before you bleed out. We need to get out of here before the cops arrive. The girls? Eric asked before drinking the contents of the vial. They'll be fine. They were almost burnt to a crisp though. One of the triads almost pushed the button that would cook them inside the, the container's good thing I took him out. Naruto answered. Eric paled, hearing Naruto's answer. The thought of him almost costing the lives of everyone he's trying to save through his methods sent a chill through his spine. He can't help but draw parallels to what happened here today to what he's planning for the future. Naruto secretly smiled. His plan of turning Eric around finally passed phase one. He never thought it would take this long, but at least it's finally done. He held on to Eric's shoulder, and they disappeared. Chapter 42, My Childhood Fuji, Shizuoka, Japan November 18, 2008, 1000 H Local Natasha and Naruto are currently on vacation. No jobs, no missions, no phones. The good life. Naruto had decided that they should go on vacation, after the emotionally trying summer, and the unexpectedly high workload of fall. He chose Fuji as their destination, since the density of nature chakra flowing down from Mount Fuji has a calming effect on him. He has been doing a lot of research about Hydra, and it's been a slow process. Hydra has a well-placed system set up. They're not working as a unified group, creating cells that barely know each other exist. A year of work only yielded him maybe 20% of all Hydra agents. 
A lot more should be sleeper agents, but he could only find them if he unabashedly used his techniques to find them, which he won't do unless he feels something is about to happen. Natasha, on the other hand, received a series of what she calls run and gun missions, half of which came from his intel. Her specialty are wine and dine intel gathering missions, which involve seducing high value targets and gathering information or killing them, so doing a series of shootouts just increases her stress level. The few social interactions she had on past months came from visiting Laura, Lila, and Cooper or having training sessions with Peggy, Peggy, and occasionally Sharon. Natasha opted not to do the operation yet since she would need three months to leave off of work and another three months on desk duty. Naruto wanted to do a whole year of physical, but admitted that she might be able to adapt to her body in a short time frame. They would have wanted to invite Jessica to the vacation too, but she's currently taking criminology classes from John Jay College of Criminology, one of the best criminology colleges in the country. She wanted to go into a college that she can pay herself, which would automatically be a community college. Still, Naruto did some covert operations, and he was able to manipulate the system so that Jessica would receive a scholarship grant from the college. His covert operations included blackmail, hacking, backdoor dealings, and impersonating some high officials. He thought it would be a whole lot easier to sneak someone into the school, but those assholes really don't want someone to have a free ride through college. Naruto only forgot one crucial detail in his plan, Jessica didn't apply to John Jay College of Criminology. The day Jessica received a letter for her acceptance to the college with a full-ride scholarship, she instantly knew that something fishy was up. She knows in her gut that Naruto has something to do with the letter, his anxious expression didn't help his case either. Jessica doesn't want to receive handouts. She wanted to work for everything she owns. Living with the pair virtually rent-free is already pushing the limits. She only accepted the offer when they deferred to her suggestion to buy the groceries. Jessica tried to investigate any signs of anomaly that could lead back to Naruto, but he did a great job of hiding his tracks. Tracks. She attempted to give the scholarship to someone else, but the college won't allow it. In the end, she accepted the scholarship begrudgingly, and is now going to college in the morning and working at night. Naruto tried to convince her to drop working for now and focus on her studies, but she wouldn't hear any of it. Still, the couple was able to persuade Jess to let them buy half the groceries. The only real problem Naruto encountered, but never talked about was Naruto's immortality, and how the couple would deal with the whole thing. They've been living in some sort of bubble, and Natasha decided this can't last for long. Naruto. Natasha quietly said. The pair chose a hotel room with one of the best views of Mount Fuji. They've been lounging on the couch, just watching the clouds move around the perfectly shaped volcano. Hmm. Naruto responded. How would you like to deal with all of this? Natasha asked vaguely. Deal with what? Naruto questioned back. You know. The whole immortality thing. Natasha added. Naruto took a deep breath. He didn't want to deal with all the complications now since he still wants the bubble to continue, but this is all out of his control now. I don't really know. Naruto said. I plan to let you decide it if we should continue being together after the operation. If you happen to say yes, I probably would just leave in around five to ten years. That way, you could find someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. He confessed, his emotions bare for Natasha to see. Natasha could understand where he's coming from. He received the gift everyone wanted to find, but now it's just a curse. Watching the people, you love waste and die. Civilizations grow then crumble. Doomed to observe the universe until the end of time. The thought of doing that alone scared her, and that's what triggered her next idea. What if I don't want us to break up? Natasha asked with renewed determination. Then I guess I'll stay with you for quite some time. Naruto replied with a wan smile. 
Natasha turned to face Naruto and locked eyes with him. Y you don't get it. What if I don't want us to separate, like ever? Natasha amended. Naruto took quite some time before he understood Natasha's words, but his reaction when he realized what she said was simply explosive. He quickly stood up from the couch and answered. Fuck no. I'm not going to make you experience any of this. It's bad enough I have to do this, but there's no way in hell I to drag you with me. Naruto exclaimed before pacing back and forth in front of the window, his anxiousness getting the best of him. Natasha was surprised by Naruto's vehement answer, but she should have expected it from a mile away. Naruto would do everything he can to make sure his loved ones are safe and all right. Being an immortal would cause a lifetime of grief, and that's undoubtedly not all right, at least in his opinion. She tried to think about how she could circumvent Naruto's bullheadedness. Natasha would like to ask the Bijou about some suggestions, but it's doubtful that Naruto would summon them to help her in this situation. She tried to think back on everything they discussed, particularly on the knowledge that she filed away deep in her mind. It took a while until she remembered a small detail that Naruto accidentally let out. How about a compromise? Natasha asked. Naruto stopped his pacing and stared dumbfoundedly, not even considering the compromise route. What do you suggest? Naruto asked slowly. Do you remember our talk about when you told me about the harem thing? Natasha said, hoping Naruto still remembers it. Yes. Naruto shyly responded. He doesn't regret the whole night since that led Jessica to be a part of their lives, but it's still an embarrassing conversation. Can you tell me the other option for an Uzumaki that's in a relationship with a non-Uzumaki? Except for the harem. Natasha prompted him. A marriage ritual of sharing an Uzumaki's vitality. Naruto answered automatically. It took a brief moment before he understood what he said. The Uzumaki marriage ritual would extend the non-Uzumaki's lifespan while the Uzumaki's lifespan would decrease, effectively closing the life gap. An unintended but welcomed outcome of which is increasing the stamina of the non-Uzumaki, and the seal used in the ritual would link the couple, keeping each other alive even through a deadly injury as long as one of them could supply the life force to heal the other. The only downside was that if one person dies, the other will follow not long after. The marriage ritual is a reversible process, since the Uzumaki acknowledges that love can die down. Cynical the lot of them. If he applies the ritual between himself and Natasha, she will acquire his immortality while having the option to leave any time she wants. A sad thought, sure, but it's the best solution for him and her if she really wants to go through with it. Natasha could see Naruto debating with himself about his answer, and he's slowly talking himself to accepting her compromise. She can admit to herself that Naruto is the best thing that ever happened to her, personally and professionally. He's like a storm that swept her life, suddenly being in every part of her life in an instant. He's like the sun, giving new life to her withering existence, slowly being swallowed by trying to wipe away the red in her ledger. She can't imagine a life anymore where Naruto is not there. Natasha internally chuckled in disbelief. How can a strong and independent woman like her be so head over heels with someone that she would even consider to be alone with someone else for eternity, just to make sure they stay together for as long as possible? That may be just how love works. You just do stupid things. Naruto walked up to her and took a deep calming breath. How about this? We can always do the marriage ceremony any time we want, but I want you to be sure about this. So, why don't we wait for three years and see how you feel about it then? Naruto suggested. Natasha didn't see anything wrong with Naruto's suggestion. It's better to make planned and informed decisions as opposed to spur-of-the-moment type deals, especially on life-changing decisions, and being partially immortal is pretty high up that list. All right. Three years. Natasha answered with a smile. Naruto released a sigh of relief, 
when he heard Natasha's answer. They have three years to think about how they should move forward in their relationship. Natasha's Safe House, New York. December 12, 2008, 2200 H Local. What time is Jessica's finals tomorrow? Natasha offhandedly asked while sitting on the bed and reading a case file Fury ordered to take home. He wants her to lead an OP next week to retrieve a possible alien artifact from some German business tycoon, and all the files are every intel they have on the target. The first one would start at 8 a.m. The last one will end at 8 p.m. Naruto automatically answered while playing Pokemon Emerald on his Game Boy Advance SP. The moment he first played a video game in this world, he was immediately hooked. He has a vast collection of gaming paraphernalia hidden in the storage seal. It ranges from retro gaming consoles all the way to top-of-the-line gaming computer setup. He rarely has any chance to play with any of those, though. Though. Jessica, on the other hand, is in her room, slaving her way through the notes and handouts. Acing all her exams would allow her to take an accelerated course that would enable her to finish in two and a half years instead of four. Why is it so long? Are all finals like that? Natasha asked. I have no idea. I only ever attended the academy, and the written exams there only last for two hours. My clones didn't have to take exams when they're spying on every class out there since they're invisible. Naruto answered, still playing his game. Natasha decided to tackle one of the mysteries that's been bugging her about Naruto. She closed her folder and placed it on the bedside table. Naruto. Can you save your game? I need to ask something. Natasha said. Naruto looked at her and nodded. He saved up his progress, Game Boy, and stored it in his storage seal before facing Natasha again. What's up? Naruto asked, trying to be cool about the more than likely hard conversation they're going to have. I'm just going to say it. How was your life before coming here? Natasha asked, but Naruto's expression of shock and confusion forced her to continue. I only heard snippets about your life, and I know that I don't know a lot of stuff about you while you probably know everything in my file the second time we met. That's likely how you know that I like Italian food and about my condition. She finished, referencing her inability to bear a child. Naruto couldn't deny anything Natasha stated. He never liked talking about his childhood or anything that happened in his time in the elemental nations. For him, it's dark past that must always be remembered but never said. Nonetheless, there are times where silence must be broken. What do you want to know? Naruto replied after releasing a sigh. Let's start with your earliest memory and worked our way up up. Natasha answered. Naruto repositioned himself on the bed. He got out of the blanket and tapped the space between his legs, calling over Natasha so he could hold her close while telling his story. Natasha recognized Naruto's need for emotional support and scooted over, essentially cuddling with him. Naruto wrapped his arms around her and held her close. As you know, my father was Minato Namikaze, the Yandame Hokage, and my mother was Kushina Uzumaki, the last surviving royal of the Uzumakis. Both of them are considered heroes in their own right. You would think the son of two heroes of the Third Shinobi War would have someone to take care of him the moment his parents died, but human nature and politics have a way of turning things around. Naruto started, his rarely seen bitterness seeping through. The first memory I remember was when I was three years old. I was living in an orphanage. Most of its occupants were orphaned in Karama's rampage. He could feel Karama reacting inside of him, but he just continued. I was playing alone outside, since the matrons won't let the other kids play with me, when a group of 9 to 12 year old kids approached me. I thought somebody finally wanted to play with me, so I ran straight to them. Next thing I know, I'm being pummeled to the ground saying something about being the fox. 
I still can't believe that I remember the whole thing. Thing. Naruto derisively chuckled. That started a daily occurrence of beatings. The matrons won't even stop it and just leave me outside. If I don't come inside before the curfew, they'll just lock me out of the orphanage. It only stopped when it was my fourth birthday. Natasha sincerely hoped that Naruto would say something positive, but it looks like it's too much to ask. At the stroke of midnight, the matrons dragged me out of bed and kicked me outside the orphanage with only the clothes on my back. I tried and pleaded to get back in for hours until I just gave up. That night started a tradition inside Kanoha. They call it the fox hunt. A cold premonition settled down on her when she heard the fox hunt, and it looks like she was right. A large group of civilians was waiting for me a few blocks away, carrying batons, knives, rocks, or just anything they could take. The mob started chasing me the moment they saw me. Of course, I ran away, but what could a four-year-old do against fully grown adults? They eventually caught me, and that's when I experienced a whole new dimension of pain. They started beating and stabbing me, but they weren't satisfied there. Naruto took a deep breath to calm himself. The memory was just too vivid. One of the men suggested to carve me up. The fuckers must have liked the idea too much since when they left me, I have no eyes and probably most of my body. Only the Uzumaki vitality, and, ironically, Kurama's Yuki kept me alive and healed all of my injuries. Natasha couldn't believe what she was hearing. How could someone do that to a child? She was already regretting asking Naruto for his story, but it's still not over. I asked everyone for help. I tried asking the random civilians, Shinobi, and even the Uchiha police force, but I somehow just made it worse. I unknowingly spread the fox hunt. Hunt. Every night, more and more people appeared, even shinobis are showing up from time to time. Someone probably high up authorized it. I mean, how could a large mob of people chasing a child around the village without the secret police or ANBU intervening? Naruto now knows that Danzo organized the fox hunts to alleviate the populace's discontent, but she doesn't need to know about it. The cycle lasted for three grueling months until I found a way to leave the village. I snuck through the drainage system until I passed the walls. I have no idea how that major security breach was overlooked, but it was a blessing for me. Naruto mused. I lived inside the forest outside the village for a year. I developed my hiding skills inside that forest since shinobis would regularly use the trees like a ninja highway. I was only found when an enemy shinobi tried to kidnap a Hyuga to be bred. It's Hinata, isn't it? Natasha interrupted. She knows that she was not his first love. That honor falls to Hinata Hyuga. She has no idea how she died, but she knows it was one of the reasons why he left the elemental nations. Yeah. My first meeting with Hinata. I didn't really do much. I just surpri surprised the shinobi, and he decided that no one can know about him, so he tried to kill me. He just has no idea about who I am and who's inside me. Naruto let out a snort as he said the last part. When he landed a killing blow on me, Kurama took over. His oppressing aura reached all the way to the village and alerted the guards. I blacked out after that. The next thing I know, I'm in the hospital, and Gigi was watching over me. That's the Hokage, right? Natasha asked. Yup. He placed me in my own apartment after I was discharged out of the hospital. He probably heard about the fox hunts while I was gone since I was also assigned a team of personal ANBU guards. It got a whole lot better after that. I was still alone most of the time, but at least I can hang out with Gigi whenever he's free. He's also the one who introduced me to Ichiraku Ramen, the universe's best food. Naruto said with a far-off look. Natasha noticed that he was about to continue his story, but he suddenly stared intently at the door. It looks like we have to continue another time since Jess can't sit straight anymore. 
Naruto whispered close to her ear while discreetly wiping his tears. Natasha was about to question Naruto's statement when he suddenly spoke up. Come inside, Jess. You have an early day tomorrow. A few seconds later, a disheveled Jessica in shorts and a white shirt stepped inside the room. Her eyes are noticeably red and watery. I was just getting some water. Jessica half lied. Jessica was getting some water when she passed by the master bedroom and heard the start of Naruto's story. His voice carries well through the walls. She couldn't help herself to know more about her roommate, so she eavesdropped. She sat down on the floor and placed her ear next to the wall. She couldn't believe how hard was Naruto's life compared to hers. The whole thing is fucked up to the extreme. Sure. Naruto replied. Come to bed with us. You need your sleep. Natasha agreed with Naruto's statement, so she scooted over and created a space between them. Jessica didn't, didn't even try to argue since she's tired as hell. She dropped onto the bed between them and spooned with Naruto while hugging Natasha. Don't worry. I'll continue the story after your finals. Naruto whispered to Jessica before giving her a peck to her cheeks and then kissing Natasha goodnight. Good night, ladies. Good night. Good luck tomorrow. Natasha said before also kissed Jessica to her lips. Good night. Jessica mumbled, half asleep. Chapter 43, Off to Afghanistan. Clint's Homestead, Missouri. January 8, 2009, 1730H Local. Foxy. Lila shouted when she saw Naruto and Natasha walking towards their house. Naruto waved exaggeratedly towards Lila, ignoring Clint's sheepish demeanor and Laura's sputtering. Foxy? Isn't that a little inappropriate coming from an almost seven-year-old? Natasha whispered towards Naruto. Nah. She only calls me that because I first came returned as a fox. Naruto answered with a grin. Of course you did. Natasha exasperatedly said. When the pair got closer to the house, they can hear Laura at the tail end of her grilling Clint. You didn't tell me that's foxy. Laura asked while pointing at Naruto. Is that why you've been installing all those cameras? She continued. Why are you getting mad at me? Get mad at him. Clint deflected towards Naruto. I'm not the who's invading our house. No. 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 You told me he's weird, and he can teleport, so don't push it towards him. We're talking about why you didn't tell me. Laura retorted. Natasha couldn't help but laugh, hearing Laura's statement. Naruto's weirdness worked for him this time. Naruto, on the other hand, can't accept Clint's description of him. Hey. I'm not weird. I'm eccentric. Naruto exclaimed when they were close to the homestead's porch. That's the same thing. Clint retorted while rubbing his forehead. Either way, the family welcomed their guest. Naruto immediately went up the stairs bringing Lila and Cooper with him, while telling stories with a doll he got from somewhere. The adults, however, went to the kitchen to catch up. What do you guys want for dinner? Laura asked when they sat down on the dining table. You should probably just leave the ingredients on the counter. I'll ask Naruto to cook later. Natasha answered, slightly getting hungry just remembering Naruto's cooking. Laura agreed instantly to Natasha's suggestion. Naruto's care package of ready-to-eat meals are to die for. She quickly got out most of her meats and produce. We're not going to be able to finish all that. Natasha stated the obvious. I'm going to let Naruto cook for at least two weeks worth of meal. I'll ask Lila to do all the asking. Laura replied, utterly unashamed. 
She continued preparing the ingredients so Naruto would have an easier time making the meals. When she sat back down, Natasha and Clint are looking at her weirdly. What? She asked in her mom voice. Nothing. Nothing. Clint and Natasha answered simultaneously. So how are you? It's been three months since you last visited. Laura asked. Clint took the hint and walked to the living room to give the ladies some semblance of privacy, but he sure as hell would eavesdrop. Everything's great. Naruto and I dealt with some problems last November, but what couple doesn't encounter any problems? Ours is just a little different. Natasha explained. That's good. Laura replied sincerely. How about the other thing? Have you talked to Naruto about that yet? She asked vaguely. Natasha released a sigh, understanding what Laura's question is about. Last time she visited, she asked a pretty loaded question. How would you go about asking your partner to consider being in a polygamous relationship? She al already anticipated that Jessica would worm her way into their life. There's no scenario with their arrangement where someone won't develop feelings outside the couple. When Natasha started to develop a certain level of fondness for Jessica, and she can see the same was true for both Naruto and Jessica. The incident the night before Jessica's finals just secured her belief that it's something possible and should be explored. Only two reasons are stopping her. One, Jessica might bolt if she tries to approach her about this. Jessica still has her anxiety about developing personal relationships, even though it's been somewhat tapered down through continuous exposure with Naruto. The second thing was the whole immortality thing. If she accepts the partial immortality Naruto will give her, Jessica would be left alone. That can't be good to her psyche. No. Not yet. I'll probably turn Naruto to the idea first though. Natasha answered before standing up. I'll check in on Naruto so he could send a clone to prepare the food. She explained before walking away. A what? Laura yelled out. Natasha stopped on her tracks and looked back at Laura. Didn't Clint tell you? Naruto could create clones to do stuff. Natasha said straightforwardly. Wow. You're a lucky girl. Laura commented with a pervy grin. Clint is already regretting his choice to listen into their conversation. EW? No. He doesn't do that. Natasha exclaimed with a shudder. It's one thing to use it for doing chores, but it's just weird to use it in sex. She added before walking out the room, afraid of what Laura might say next. Natasha walked towards Lila's open room door. She can hear the laughter coming from both Lila and Cooper, as well as Naruto's energetic storytelling. She hanged around outside the room, listening in on the group's playtime. Natasha could imagine them having a family together. She doesn't know how, how the logistics of all that, but ever since she heard Naruto's plan for her, she can't get out of her mind of having a kid together with him. Sure, the kid would probably need a shit ton of therapy since his her parents is a world-class spy and a godlike sociopathic ninja, but they would be safe and would have an unpredictable life. Hey, Nat. Naruto's shout shook her out of her musing. Are you all right? You seem out of it. Oh, nothing. I just wanted for you to send down a clone. Natasha replied. Laura wants you to cook a lot of food. Sure. No problem. Stark Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles. February 11, 2009, 1000H Local. Naruto is casually walking towards the mansion's front door. He could Horatian straight to his room, but sometimes taking it slow is good for the soul. Good morning, sir. It's kind of you to use the front door today. Jarvis said through the speakers. Wow, Jarv. When did Tony finish the sarcasm update? Naruto asked jokingly, 
but it looks like there's a real answer. Just three days ago, sir. Jarvis answered before the door opened. The family is in the second floor lounge with Colonel Rhodes. He informed. Thank you, Jarv. Naruto shouted while walking inside the house. Naruto headed straight to the lounge and saw Tony and Rhodey packing bags while Pepper entertains Morgan. They're going to Afghanistan tomorrow morning, so they decided it's better if Rhodey would just stay over today. Happy might be doing some errands, that might be why he's unavailable. Their trip to Afghanistan is the whole reason why he visited today, though. Hi, Naruto. Pepper, being the first one who saw him, greeted. Good to see you, Pepper. Naruto greeted back before kneeling in front of her. Hi, Morgan. He said with a wide smile. Ruto. Morgan jumped from Pepper's arms and hugged Naruto. What? Are we chum meet? Tony said behind them since Naruto didn't even greet them, before focusing his attention on Morgan. Don't worry, man. Naruto replied while giving Morgan back to Pepper. To Pepper. His expression changed to something more serious. We have to talk. He said before looking at Pepper. You can join in. But there's no way that I want Morgan to be here for any of this. Pepper heard the gravity of Naruto's words. She Morgan towards her room so she could entertain herself for a while. Jarvis will alert them if something dangerous is about to happen to Morgan. While Pepper's taking Morgan away, Naruto decided to set up the talk. Tony. Have you installed Jarvis's auto-hacking system? Naruto asked. Yup. Finished that one a year ago. Tony boasted. Can it go past Pentagon and DoD's firewalls? Naruto continued. Where do you think I tested it? Tony asked sarcastically. Okay. Where are you going with this? Rhodey interjected, not liking where the conversations headed. Again. You're worrying too much. You should probably take a vacation. Naruto offhandedly advised. Jarvis. Pull up every military file you can find about Social Security number 878-64-7437. Show it on the TV when I tell you to. Confirmation, sir. Jarvis asked. One of the safeguards Pepper insisted on placing Jarvis's hacking function is an explicit confirmation from Tony since, without it, Morgan may accidentally hack the Pentagon without anyone knowing. Especially now when she's learning about shapes and numbers. Go ahead, Jarvis. Tony said, giving the signal. I have no idea about what this is about, but hacking into the Pentagon and DoD is a pretty bad thing. Rhodey let out, being the voice of reason. Sure, Tony hacks their system on a daily basis, but that's just for fun. Seriously, Rhodey. You need to relax. Naruto advised again while pulling out three folders behind him. I already have the guy's file right here. I just need corroborating data. He finished with a shrug. Rhodey Long figured out that Naruto could get you anything. For God's sake, he found a 1787 Chateau Lafite Rothschild on a dare. But getting three copies of a personnel file, clearly marked top secret, is a whole new level of absurd. He was about to scold Naruto for taking out secret files when Pepper returned. Great. Everybody's here. Naruto announced. Now. Have a seat. The trio followed his instructions, already knowing that he won't continue unless they followed. Let's start with an easy one. There's a massive security leak in your company. He informed Tony. What? Why would you say that? Tony asked, not able to think about any security leaks they know of that would warrant the use of the word massive. I have no idea how, but I know for a fact that someone in your company tipped a terrorist cell called the Ten Rings. 
Rhodey instantly recognized the name. It's one of the fastest growing terrorist group that broke off Al Qaeda. I don't know who's that someone, though, but it must be someone high up since they're using your company's triple encryption protocol. Fuck. I thought we found all of them. Tony mumbled. Apparently not. Naruto replied. That's not the worst part. They're showing some weird activity, moving away from your testing site. I'll find out more in the next few days. He already found a lot of their bases, even their hidden ones, but he has no ideas which of those places those assholes will use. I'm not even going to question about how you know all about some obviously classified information, but what's got to do with the personnel file you have? Rhodey asked. J.A.R.V., could you show the photo of the soldier I asked you to find? Naruto requested. Of course, sir. Jarvis replied. The television turned on, showing a headshot and full-body shot of a soldier. The soldier is a 5 feet 11 inches Caucasian with a large build. He has brown hair, hair and dark brown eyes. Rhodey could identify the marine insignia on his uniform. Francis David Castle, Senior Frank Castle for short. He's a 28-year-old, first sergeant. Has a wife and two kids, a girl and a boy. Naruto recounted while giving his three audiences a folder each. Marine Force Recon. Sniper. One of the best around. I know only three guys that can beat his record. He finished. When Tony heard the last part, he had to ask. Who's the three guys? Tony asked. I'm glad you asked. Naruto said with a grin. Number three is the FBI director himself, Seely Booth. Former Army Ranger. Number two is the partner of my girlfriend. Can't really say his name, though. He paused for dramatic effect. Number one, of course, is yours truly. He finished with a bow. Bullshit. Booth is a legend. The guy killed someone 3.5 kilometers away. No way someone could beat that. Rhodey retorted. Believe whatever you like. Naruto replied with a triumphant grin. Pepper is having a small panic attack at the end of the couch. She just learned that there's a leak inside their company, and a terrorist organization is targeting her partner and boss. Can we move on to more important topics? Like maybe cancelling the demonstration in Afghanistan? Pepper exclaimed. We can't do that. We'll lose a lot of our customers when we do that. Tony answered. He would not want to go there now, but they wouldn't just lose that contract. Other deals hinge on it too. I'll call for some extra security. All on the down low. Rhodey said while pulling out his phone. Don't tell anyone about this guy. Naruto said while pointing to the picture of Frank Castle. Why did you tell us about him, anyway? Tony asked. Because he's coming with you. Naruto replied. I called in one of my favors. He'll join you at the airport. I would have asked an employee of mine to join you, but I sent him on some errand. He added. Eric would have been a perfect candidate since he's an MIT candidate. Candidate. He can move undercover as an assistant to Tony's, but he's currently in Somalia. Naruto wanted for him to see what would happen if any conflict happens without proper protection given to the masses. Frank here would act as an honorably discharged soldier, who's working as your and primary maintenance officer for the Jericho, as well as a main military consultant. Naruto informed them. You had this planned out, huh? Rhodey commented. Yup. I just hope Tony doesn't piss off Frank enough to kill him. Naruto added. Hey. I'm not that bad. Tony retorted. Sure. Sure. 
Naruto replied sarcastically before standing up. Be careful on your trip. Don't forget to bring the paper I gave you. He said to Tony before turning to Pepper. I'll just stop by Morgan's room to say goodbye. Your birthday gift is on the table in the living room. You're going to love it. He finished before going out of the room. I really need to figure out how he does all those things. Tony murmured to himself. You should figure out why Naruto remembers my birthday, but not you. Pepper countered. I'm just going to leave you to discuss all that. Rhodey said in a quiet voice before making a tactical retreat. Natasha's Safe House, New York. February 13th, 2009, 0230 H Local. Natasha woke up due to the feeling of someone watching her. That particular skill has been developed through the training in the Red Room. Spies need to be alert at all times, even during sleep. She has no idea how Naruto doesn't have that trait considering his former profession, but it could also be a side effect of being immortal. He just doesn't have to think about being in danger since he's never really in danger. Natasha slowly opened her eyes and saw Naruto sleeping at the center of the bed with Jessica, at the opposite side of him, hugging his arm like a teddy bear. She turned her look to where she feels the direction of what's watching her coming from while simultaneously pulling out a knife from under her pillow. She saw a bald European woman wearing yellow monk, monk robes and an African-American man wearing green and blue robes. Without a second loss, she tossed the knives towards the duo, but sparking orange shield stopped the blades in its tracks. Natasha groaned and slapped Naruto's chest, waking him up, which also caused Jessica to wake up. Some of your weird friends are visiting. Natasha deadpanned. Jessica quickly got out of her drowsy state and pulled the blankets to cover herself. Naruto, on the other hand, sits on the opposite of the spectrum. He's still out of it, so Natasha tried something drastic. We have no more ramen. Natasha whispered to Naruto's ear. It had an immediate effect. What? Naruto shouted, jumping on top of the bed in a slight panic. He slowly took his surroundings and saw the weird people by the foot of the bed. Is this really the fox we are looking for? The man asked, skepticism oozing out of him. Yes. I'm sure. I can't see his future. The woman replied. What the hell? What are you doing here? Jessica exclaimed. I'm sorry for the intrusion, but we need to talk with your mate as soon as possible. The woman replied apologetically. We're trying to sleep. Jessica cried out while kicking Naruto towards them. Thank you for your consideration. The woman replied before she gestured for the man to get out of the room, followed by her. Naruto would have protested, but Jess's hard glare towards him made him think twice. He walked out of the room and closed the door. Natasha took her pistol from the side table and got out of bed. I'll check what's going on. Natasha told Jess. Sure. Jessica replied, already half asleep. She still has class early, early in the morning, and no one would begrudge her of trying to sleep now. Natasha followed Naruto out of the room and towards the living room. She saw the trio standing around. The man is eyeing Naruto warily. The woman is the representation of calm and serene while Naruto is just plain bored. Now that everyone's here, I can start to introduce ourselves. The woman said the moment she stepped inside the living room. My student here is Master Carl Mordo. I'm simply called the Ancient One, the current Sorcerer Supreme. We're both masters of the mystic arts. Natasha couldn't help but groan internally. Of course, magic is real. Why wouldn't it? And we're here to say my request to you, Yellow Fox. Naruto understood the Ancient One's nickname for him, but he has no idea how she knew about him. He has found signs of legitimate mysticism and magic in this world, 
but he never found someone who practices it. What is it? Naruto asked. Don't save Tony Stark from the Ten Rings. The fate of the universe hinges on it. Chapter 44, Almost a Fight Natasha's Safe House, New York February 13, 2009, 0245 H Local Don't save Tony Stark from the Ten Rings. The fate of the universe hinges on it. The Ancient One said. You ugh. Naruto groaned loudly. Another one of those crazy people. He mumbled to himself before walking back and grabbing Nat's arms. Come on. Let's leave these wackos here. He finished. Natasha was still wary about the pair, but she followed Naruto either way. The message about Tony Stark is concerning though. She knows Naruto has some form of contact with Tony Stark. The doctors and nurses that came to Stark Mansion in 2006 have finally been solved. The latest reports about Stark show that he has somehow hidden a child of his. A daughter between him and Virginia Potts. The daughter has no official records and has never been in public. There's also some indication that there are four inhabitants in the mansion based on which rooms look to be consistently used. Still, S.H.I.E.L.D. has no idea who's the possible fourth person since no one was ever seen an unknown person entering the household. Natasha had the strongest feeling that Naruto was the one staying there. He probably knew about the kid too. The bald chick just gave her suspicion more credence. Naruto was about to open the bedroom door when sparking orange strings looped around his arm. He and Natasha followed the lines and saw it was coming from the Mordo. Get inside. Naruto ordered Natasha with no room for debate. The moment she saw real honest-to-god magic coming from the two, she knows her guns won't do shit to them, so she went inside the bedroom. She was preparing herself for any eventuality. Mordo was about to send another binding spell to Natasha, but the Ancient One stopped him. Let Ms. Romanoff be. The Ancient One said. When Natasha closed the door, Naruto looked back at Mordo. Let me go. Naruto said in a whisper. No. You're going to listen. Mordo answered back, still maintaining the binding spell. Naruto took a deep breath and did a series of one-hand seals and slapped his palm to the closest wall. Black writing spread out of the room, startling the Ancient One and Mordo. Runes are what considered the written programming of the universe. It can do a lot more things that simple spells and phrases could not. As such, runes take a long time to make since interaction with each character needs to be considered. They also need to be carved or engraved since the energy running through the characters would deform simple writing. The fact that the man in front of them can create complicated, unidentifiable runes with simple hand signs is a frightening thought. You got ten minutes to convince me not to end you right here. Naruto threatened while his eyes changed into something strange that's emitting a white glow. The Ancient One decided it's best not to have a conflict right now, especially as the man they're talking to is still a huge unknown. This the Eye of Agamotto. The Ancient One started while lifting the eye-shaped medallion that's hanging around her neck. A powerful artifact created by my predecessor that utilizes one of the crystallization of the aspects of the universe. The Aspect of Time She said while opening the eye's iris, releasing a green glow. With this, I can see all the possible futures that around me. I usually wouldn't see past my death shortly, but your influence has changed not only changed mine, but everyone else's fate. It allowed me to take a peek of the future past my own. She explained. Still doesn't explain why I shouldn't save Tony, and the whole fate of the universe. Naruto retorted, silently informing his clones to gather up nature chakra. His life would be fraught with challenges and heartaches. A series of heroism and self-sacrifice that would lead to his eventual demise. But in the end, he would save half the life in the universe. 
Unfortunately, that's all I can say. The Ancient One replied. That's some pretty specific details. I just can't help but feel there's something not quite right about your story. Naruto commented, studying every word and actions the Ancient One used. Two small details finally clued him in on what's bugging him. You were surprised. He mumbled. The Ancient One could see the gears running in the fox's mind. You can't see me with that medallion of yours. He concluded. The Ancient One was surprised, a rare feeling that's been increasing as more time continues. She has not prepared for this conversation, since the Time Stone can't see the fox, so she decided that she would let him think she knows his future too. But it looks like it's for naught. You never called me by my name, and you were surprised. Which means your necklace can't show anything that involves me. Naruto said with a grin while still internally counting the seconds down. The Ancient One gave up her ruse, seeing there's no point in trying to lie right now. You have deduced it quite well. The Ancient One conceded magnanimously while hiding her frustration. Not being in control is a strange feeling she hasn't felt for a long time. The Time Stone afforded her the luxury always to be prepared for any eventuality. Care to share your opinions on why? Naruto asked. Mordo has the feeling that the fox is playing them. He has no idea how or why, but the sinking feeling in his gut is pervasive. Of course. The Ancient One replied. Maybe giving something more concrete might turn the conversation. 1. You could be an entity not from this universe, causing you to be outside the influence of this universe. 2. You have enough power within you that you could overpower the aspects. This essentially makes you a god. The authority of the aspects won't work on you. 3. You are a true immortal. Outside the influence of time. This would make you invisible to the power of the eye. She's reading his expression as she lists down her hypothesis, but the fox's countenance remained neutral. The question is, which one are you? She asked. Naruto flashed a dark grin to the Ancient One's question. Fate is such a polarizing concept. Others think it's a comforting concept. Whatever happens, you'll be where you're supposed to be. But for him, it's a constricting idea that he just wants to bash in. 5. 4. Naruto thought to himself. Your time just ran out. He said before flexing his arms, causing the binding spell to break. N Naruto rushed towards the man while conjuring a kunai into his hands. Mordo felt the recoil of the binding spell breaking, and was unable to respond to Naruto's assault. Lucky for him, the Ancient One quickly created a series of Tau Mandalas that was able to stop Naruto's kunai from stabbing Mordo in his jugular. She then created a portal that slammed into Naruto, causing him to be transported to the Mirror Dimension. The Mirror Dimension is a world directly attached to their current universe. It serves as a training ground for sorcerers testing powerful spells, and a prison for everyone who doesn't have a sling ring. Of course, Naruto doesn't know any of this, but he can see hundreds of people in robes similar to the one the Ancient One and Mordo are wearing. Before he could react, thousands of sparking orange strings and red bands wrapped around his body, effectively holding him in place. He tried moving his fingers, but it seems the ropes are tight enough to prevent any movement. In front of him, another portal opened up, revealing the Ancient One and Mordo walking in. It isn't my attention to this, but you left me with no choice. The Ancient One said with a small bow. I say you look pretty prepared for someone not intending to do this. Naruto calmly commented. I got a question, though. The Ancient One raised her eyebrows, urging him to continue. How many of them are you willing to sacrifice before leaving me alone? He asked. No one, but the fate of the universe hangs in the balance, and you won't be the one to tip it over towards our demise. The Ancient One defended. 
Wrong answer. Naruto replied. The Ancient One thought he was just bluffing until she noticed that one by one, one, the binding spells, and the crimson bands of Sidorak are disappearing. She and Mordo looked towards the direction of where the spells are coming from and saw a horrible sight. Metal threads are holding up the ripped body parts of maybe twenty apprentices and five masters. The remaining sorcerers have metal threads crawling around their bodies. The only reason the spells are still holding is that they're still channeling through their hands. You should think about your approach next time. Naruto's voice came from behind the two. The Ancient One and Mordo jumped away while conjuring Tao Mandalas. At the corner of their vision, the man inside the binding slowly disappeared. You got three choices here. Bring me back, and we could all be buddies. You could try to fight me, and see how many of you can get out of here intact. He said while lifting his fingers. Or, you could just leave me alone here, and we'll just forget about the whole thing. He finished. The decision's evident for the current Sorcerer Supreme. If she accepts the third option, they could just leave him here, trapped in eternity in the mirror dimension. If somehow, in the future, the world needs his help, the sorcerers can just let him out. Either way, it's the best choice. It's too bad she can't use the time zone to check the future, and be sure of her decision. Let them go, and we'll leave. The Ancient One said. What do you think, am I? Stupid? You leave first, then I'll let them go, and then they'll leave. What's the point of a hostage if you can't use them? Naruto retorted. I'll leave. He stays and goes with the rest. The Ancient One bargained, preferring to leave Mordo behind so that someone could make sure everyone's safe. Or at least the ones that are still alive. Deal. Naruto accepted. The Ancient One gave Mordo a loaded look, silently ordering him to make sure everyone's okay before opening a portal and leaving. Leaving. As soon as she left, Naruto let the other sorcerers go. Releasing them by batch and making sure the previous batch leave first before another one leaves. Eventually, only Naruto and Mordo are left. Before Mordo leaves though, he said his piece. We are the silent protectors of the world, and it's our job to protect it at all costs, Mordo said before opening the portal. Well, you're doing a pretty shitty job of it if the fate of the universe falls to a billionaire philanthropist. Naruto retorted before Mordo could completely close the portal. He then looked around and chuckled. Stupid assholes. He said before he suddenly popped, sending the memories back to the real Naruto, who's lying on the bed back at the apartment. What happened? Natasha asked when Naruto's eyes opened. When Natasha entered the room, she tried to listen in on the conversation through the door, but it suddenly became eerily silent. Naruto must have used his few injutsu to isolate the next room. Ten minutes later, though, Naruto suddenly appeared in the room. Apparently, he left fortified clones to deal with all the hubbub since he wanted to sleep. They left me in some mirror dimension. Hundreds of them bound me in the same orange string and another red one. I killed a few of them to send a message. They then left me in that mirror dimension without a second thought. The whole place must be a prison of some kind. Naruto explained. What are you going to do? Natasha asked. I placed a Horatian seal on every one. I'll just track them from time to time. Naruto replied with a shrug. Should I report to Fury about this? Natasha inquired. A whole organization of sorcerers is a pretty big thing. Nar Naruto thought about it for a second. It's probably a bad idea to let Fury know about the whole magic being real thing, but that's probably what he needs right now. Yeah. Naruto answered with a dark grin. Every time Naruto flashes that smile, Somebody would want to rip their hair out. What are you thinking, Naruto? Natasha asked warily. 
When an international soy agency starts to look into a secret organization of mystics, what do you think would happen? Naruto answered with a question of his own. Natasha couldn't help but groan. The whole chaos that would ensue after would cause her to lose a ton of free time. Two baldies duking it out. What can be more fun than that? He mused before lying back down. That's when he felt a familiar pull from a Horatian seal. Ugh. Can't I get some decent sleep? Naruto commented with a groan. I have to go, N.A.T. What is it this time? Natasha asked, utterly exasperated. I have no idea, but it's probably Tony. Naruto replied. Someday, you're going to tell how you two became so chummy. Natasha stated. Sure. Sure. Naruto retorted sarcastically before disappearing. Bagram Air Force Base, Afghanistan. February 13, 2009, 0900H Local. For your consideration, the Jericho. Tony said theatrically before the shockwave from the explosions reaches their position. Applause spread throughout the audience as soon as they recovered. The usual banter started between the U.S. and Afghan military officials, Tony, and some DOD representatives. Frank, on the other hand, kept a low profile in the background. He was scanning the surroundings for any possible threat. It's weird for him wearing civilian clothes out in the middle of the desert. The least civilian clothes he has when deployed is a white shirt and khaki combat pants. He's trying to stay away from large groups and the main base since somebody might recognize him and blow his cover. Frank still can't believe he agreed to do a bodyguarding job for a billionaire. If Naruto didn't save Curtis from that suicide bom bomber, he would not even consider doing this job for any amount of money. He's in denial of how Naruto stopped the suicide bomber, but he recognizes that Naruto did something. It looks like the mystery of how Curtis could suddenly appear next to him with a blonde man would remain a mystery forever. It took another hour of standing around in the middle of the desert before Tony walked towards him. We're going to head towards Kabul. The generals are not here. For some reason, the a-holes are not where they're supposed to be. Tony informed Frank. He thought they could return to the U.S. quickly. Naruto's warning about the terrorist group is making him jumpier than usual. We going to take a chopper? Frank asked with a gruff voice. No. The cheap a-holes can only spare a four-humby convoy. Tony replied at the same time as the convoy arrived. Frank can see that their guards are all as green as they come. The whole thing is triggering the warning bells inside his head. He unconsciously reached for a pistol and strapped to his back, but he was able to stop himself. Hey, Rody. You coming? Tony shouted since Rody is talking with the Humvee driver. Nah. I have to check the planes. Rody answered back. It's not abnormal for Rody to be pulled in by military bases to check with their planes since he's one of the best pilots around. Tony started walking to the Humvees, Frank following closely behind him. The two got on the third car from the front with Tony sitting in the middle of the back seat with armed soldiers on each side, and Frank got on the passenger side seat. Be careful out there. Rody added before the slapping the roof of the car, signaling the convoy could go. Tony sure had a way with people since, after 20 minutes, he's taking selfies with every soldier inside their car. Frank was going to rep reprimand the soldiers for their unprofessional behavior when the lead car suddenly exploded. The convoy had no choice but to stop. Ambush. Frank shouted through the radio. The rear car was about to do a reverse J maneuver when it suddenly exploded too. Convoy from Bagram to Kabul carrying HVT under attack. 25 minutes away from Bagram. Requesting immediate reinforcements. Frank rapidly said through the radio while simultaneously recording it. He set it to play on a loop. 
Everybody dismount. He ordered. The green soldiers didn't even question the order. Having someone to lead them allows them to push past the panic and move automatically. Every soldier got off the car and found cover, shooting at everyone who's not one of them. You. You. Frank pointed to the two closest guys next to him. Man the 50 calories. The two soldiers got in the Humvees and started using the machine guns. Frank pulled the frozen Tony out of the car and dragged him towards the embankment at the side of the road. He grabbed Tony's lapels and shook him hard to snap him out of his stupor. Get it together. We're going to get out of here. You hear me? Frank yelled to Tony's face. Tony repeatedly nodded, thankful for something to focus on except for the blaring gunfire, but it didn't last for long since they both heard something dropping behind Tony. The pair looked behind them and saw a mortar shell marked with the logo of Stark Industries. Frank went wide eye and quickly grabbed Tony. He was starting to pull him away when the mortar exploded and everything went black. Tony, on the other hand, remained half-conscious but quickly succumbing to the darkness. He could feel the burning sensation in his chest before he passed out. Northern Afghanistan February 13, 2009, 1145H Local Tony woke up with most of his body in pain, especially around his chest. Slowly he opened his eyes and saw the ceiling, which is weirdly made of rock. He felt something uncomfortable in his nose, grabbed it, and pulled it out, causing him to cough. Looks like the magnet worked. Tony heard Frank said. He turned towards where the voice is coming from and saw a man shaving. The man looks to be a six feet one inch, fifty-something-year-old man with pepper-gray receding hair and slight build. He seems to have a Middle Eastern ethnicity and might be some kind of doctor. Doctor. Ah. Uh. Yes. The great Tony Stark seems to be awake. The man replied before turning towards Stark. I'm Ho Eenson. Your doctor for now. How are you? The man now named Ho Eenson asked, but Tony ignored it and opted to lift his shirt. What did you do to me? Tony questioned back referring to the metal contraption in his chest connected to the car battery. That's an electromagnet. The only thing keeping these. Eenson said while lifting a vial filled with metal shards and shaking it. From reaching your heart as you heal. I can't remove some of them since they're too close to your heart. Tony gave Eenson a grateful nod before turning to Frank. How are you? Tony asked. A little beaten up, but I'll live. Frank replied gruffly. He's sugarcoating it. Your capturers wanted to kill him since he's a former military. The only reason he's still alive is that a manifest said he's the lead maintenance and operator of your Jericho missiles. Eenson remarked. Either way. We need to get out of here. Frank suggested, ignoring that his lie has been exposed. As I said, there's no form of communication device inside this room, and there are at least 50 armed men just outside that door. Eenson retorted exasperatedly. Besides, we always have some company. He added, gesturing to the camera mounted at the aid of the room. I noticed. Frank replied. Why is no one coming in if they're always watching us? Tony asked. If the terrorist wanted him for something, they should be storming in as soon as he was awake. Because I suggested they wait until later tonight. Any stress right now might cause the metal shards to stab your heart suddenly, and they don't want that. Eenson answered. Tony thought hard on how they could get out. He scanned the room for anything they could use to get out. He noticed the forge on the other side of the room. They could make weapons, but that would take time. Time they don't have since they're always on camera. That's when he noticed his wallet on top of the table. 
Give that to me. Tony ordered urgently. Frank reached for it and tossed it towards him. As soon as he caught it, he started searching inside it. He found what he's looking for at the back of his picture. Good thing he didn't use Pepper and Morgan's photo as his wallet picture, or a terrorist cell might have more leverage against him. Tony pulled out a piece of paper and unfolded it. It's the strip of paper with writings Naruto told him to hold on to and tear the bottom half if he's in trouble. What's that? Frank asked. Our reinforcement. Tony replied before tearing the paper. Tony expected something to happen. Maybe a small beeping sound or flashing lights, but it just remained the same. The group waited for a whole minute, but nothing happened. Well, that's anticlimactic. Tony commented. What are you calling anticlimactic? Naruto's voice was suddenly heard inside the room. The group saw Naruto walking out from a pillar behind Tony. So, need some help getting out? He asked the stunned group. Chapter 45, Project Night Northern Afghanistan February 13, 2009, 1205H Local So, need some help getting out? Naruto asked, but it looks like he underestimated the terrorists' paranoia since shouting is coming from the other side of the door. Come on. I need some answers quickly. He urged. Tony's thinking on how to proceed. Usually, he would just get out of there, but his newly developed sense of morality that came when his daughter arrived in the world is messing with his brain. He looked towards Einson and asked a question that will determine his decision. What do they want with me? Tony asked. Einson released a sigh and quickly formulated an answer. The voices outside are started getting louder which added more pressure to the situation. Frank decided he needs to prepare for any stupid decision the billionaire makes, so he took two metal rods and walked towards the side of the door. He readied himself to bash some skulls in. They are your most loyal customers. The Ten Rings want you to make them the Jericho. The only thing they can't buy from their source. Einson answered. Tony got all that he needed from Einson. Get us out of here. Tony told Naruto. Bring us to the mansion. I need to pick up something. Naruto suddenly became extremely giddy and dragged Tony and Insen towards Frank. Good thing, Tony had the presence of mind to carry the car battery powering his electromagnet. Come on, man. Grab on. We got to go. Naruto said while extending his free hand towards Frank. When Frank hesitated, Naruto grabbed onto him, and the whole group disappeared. Just in time, too, since the door opened not long after. Stark Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles February 13, 2009, 0035H Local The group appeared in Tony's underground garage. Frank managed to stay upright, even against the onslaught of disorientation. Tony and Einson, on the other hand, dropped to the floor with Einson being the worst off since his one shake away from barfing. Motherfucker. So that's how you do it. Tony exclaimed. He always wondered how Naruto could get in and out of the mansion without triggering any security measure. In the end, he just gave up and just ordered Jarvis to report when he's spotted inside the house. What is it? Quantum entanglement? Wormholes? He asked genuinely curious on how Naruto does it. His scientific and analytical mind screaming at him to figure it out. That's a secret man. Naruto answered cheekily, causing Tony to grumble. Have you finished it? Naruto asked. Not quite. Tony replied while slowly getting up on his feet. He carried the car battery and hobbled over towards the work table. You know it's been tossed at the back burner ever since Morgan came. When he reached the desk, he double-tapped the corner causing it to glow. Jarvis. 
pull-up project night, and the arc reactor design. He ordered. Certainly, sir, and may I say it's good to see you somewhat okay. Jarvis replied. The sudden appearance of another voice caused Frank to heighten his alert level, but quickly calmed down when he saw Tony, and Naruto remained calm. Should I inform Ms. Potts of your arrival? He asked. What time is it? Tony asked no idea how long he's been out cold. It's currently a quarter to one. Jarvis answered. I've only been out for around three hours. Fuck, getting blown up really messes with your head. Tony mused to himself after quickly computing the time difference between L.A. and Afghanistan. Don't wake them up. I'll tell them myself later. Of course, sir. Jarvis replied before the hollow table turned on, showing the 3D plans for one Malawin Kwacha and the arc reactor. Frank pulled Enson towards the chair near the table since the travel hit Enson hard. Where the hell are we? Frank asked Naruto. L.A., specifically Tony's garage. Naruto answered. Naruto's assertion surprised Frank, but his straightforward and military thinking save him a lot of headaches. Curtis Thing? Frank asked. Yup, Curtis Thing. Naruto replied. Frank then filed away the whole thing as something he would no think about, and think of as something he would never figure out. You got beer and food? Frank asked Tony who's busy flicking away stuff at the hollow board and talking to the weird robot voice. Food can be found on the counter to your right, and the beverages are inside the refrigerator under it, Mr. Castle. Jarvis was the one who replied. Fuck. That's just weird. Frank mumbled to himself while going to the counter. Yo. Insen. Want some? He asks the still dizzy Ensign as he was picking up some food. Just water. Ensign replied. Frank picked up a few things, but he made sure to get enough beer. When he got back to the table, he placed a water bottle in front of Ensign and dumped the rest of what he got in front of him. Naruto. Beer? Frank asked while lifting a can. Sure. Frank tossed the can towards Naruto. He then opened it and took a swig out of it. What's he doing anyway? Frank asked, gesturing towards Tony. Finishing a project that's been in the back burner for too long. Naruto answered with a shrug, but he noticed Frank's confused expression, so he continued. You three can't suddenly appear stateside when you should have been kidnapped. That'll send warning bells to everyone and a whole bunch of investigation would occur. That's why I was just going to leave you guys in the middle of the desert, so that the search party could find you guys. Frank understood Naruto's reasoning. The military would be all over up Naruto's as the moment they find out that someone can get in and out of any situation quickly. But Tony wanted to get back here, so he probably wants to fight his way out of the hole. He finished. He's going to fight his way out? He'll turn tail as soon as the first bullet is fired. Frank retorted skeptically. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Naruto replied. He helped me take down the mob in Vegas, you know. Frank remembered the news about that one, but hearing Naruto, Naruto's involved made the whole thing make more sense. He's not a fighter or a soldier. Frank said, pointing out the obvious. He won't be able to take down all those terrorists. He offered his opinion. You can join too if you want. Naruto retorted. Give a kid a nuke, and he can change the tides of war. Same concept here. He said, subtly referring to himself. Frank couldn't exactly deny Naruto's statement. But it begs the question, what is Stark making? Tony has been working on the night in between the Jericho and Jarvis. It came to him after the situation in Vegas. Being left in the sidelines through the whole ordeal left a bad taste in his mouth, 
so he started on the project right after he returned to LA. It just slowly get sidelined as he began to work on Jarvis and when Morgan arrived. He has 90% of the things done, but the remaining 10% are the crucial mechanics and electronics that need to be streamlined through continuous testing. That's why he's removing a lot of part design to make the fabrication time shorter. The arc reactor is the problem. Tony needs to redesign the whole thing so that it could function as an electromagnet as well as a high-output electric source to power the night. Run the simulations. Tony ordered when he was satisfied enough with the modifications he made. The end result of his changes is an ugly behemoth that just wants to make him puke, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Yes, sir. Running it now. Simulation finished. The prototype reactor would produce 1 gigajoule per second. The suit, on the other hand, would only handle 10 minutes of rigorous use. Jarvis reported. That's a lot shorter than I thought. Tony said to himself. How long would the fabrication take? Six hours, sir. However, the arc reactor needs more precise hands. Jarvis replied. I should have known it will never be that easy. Tony complained with a shake of his head. He walked over to Ensign, Ensign and tugged him by the collar. Wakey. Wakey. You're going to help me upgrade this. He said while tapping his chest. Ensign had no choice but to agree. Tony then looked towards Naruto and Frank. You two are helping too. Ha ha ha. No way, man. I need to check with my girlfriend first. I just left her in the apartment with our roommate. Naruto replied quickly before getting roped in. Why the hell do you still have a room here if you got an apartment? Tony asked with an incredulous look. I like the view. Naruto answered with a shrug. Wait. Is that roommate of yours the same chick that's been joining your threesome? Tony asked with overflowing curiosity. Even the always serious and loyal Frank Castle perked up hearing Tony's question. Yep. I just told you. I left them in the apartment on the bed. Naruto replied, not seeing anything wrong with his answer. I just want you to know. I fucking hate you right now. Tony stated with conviction. Ensign and Frank silently agreed with Tony's assertion. Tony released a sigh and rubbed the bridge of his nose. Just go already. Be back by eight. He said. Sure thing. Anything I need to bring back? Naruto asked. Nah. Got everything here. Tony answered. Bring me something I can use to shoot people. Frank amended. Tony let out a snort and walked towards an empty wall. This drew everyone's attention. He placed his palm relatively high up the wall. After a few moments, the wall split open, revealing a small armory. Believe me, Frank. I got everything. Tony reiterated with a victorious grin. Frank checked the loadout, and he has no choice but to be impressed. I think we're going to get along just fine. Frank stated. You better not let Pepper know about this. Naruto warned before suddenly disappearing. Do we really need to go back using that? Tony asked, which caused Ensign to turn green all over again. Natasha's Safe House, New York. February 13, 2009, 0400 H Local. Naruto appeared inside the living room, and he immediately went towards the bedroom, while making sure he doesn't wake up Jessica. When he got inside, he noticed that Jessica is the only person on the bed. He looked around and saw light coming out from under the door of the bathroom. Naruto approached the door and knocked. Naruto? 
Natasha asked from the other side of the door. Yes. It's me, Haim. Naruto answered. Wait a minute. I'm getting out in a sec. Natasha replied. Naruto walked back towards the bed and sat on it. A few moments later, Natasha got out of the bathroom wearing her full combat suit. Good thing you came by. I need a ride. She said while checking her gear and walking out of the bedroom. Why and where? Naruto inquired, following Natasha out. Fury got the report about Stark's kidnapping. He wants everyone to report in. Natasha replied, wearing her boots. Can I come? Naruto asked with puppy dog eyes. I'll be invisible, I promise. He added. Natasha thought about how much security protocols she's going to break, but no one can resist that particular look. It's at the same level as Lila's begging face. She has no idea how it was possible, but it's there. All right. Come on. Natasha agreed exasperatedly, although she's laughing inside. Yay. Naruto let out a small childish cheer before holding Natasha's hand. He looked at Natasha and waited for her signal before disappearing. Triskelion, Washington, D.C. February 13th, 2009, 0420H Local. The pair appeared at Natasha's office. Natasha took a few seconds to recollect herself. A whole lot of improvement compared to her first experience with it. You're going to watch only. Don't do anything. I don't want Fury to have an aneurysm. Natasha ordered. Naruto just nodded before doing a single hand sign and slowly disappearing from her view. When she can't see him anymore, she walked out of the room and headed straight to the meeting room sent to her by Fury. It took a few minutes of going around the building, but Natasha eventually reached her destination. She went straight in without knocking. She saw a large group of people already inside, including Phil and Clint, which she immediately went to. Any news? Natasha asked as soon as she sat down. Of course, she could just ask Naruto, but it would only make it a lot harder to lie if she knows anything beforehand. Around 10 a.m. local, Tony Stark's convoy from Bagram Air Base to Kabul had been ambushed. Everyone's dead but accounted for except for two passengers, Tony Stark, and an unidentified TCH. All signs point toward inside job, but no proof as of yet except for three things. Somehow, all choppers are either in use or out of commission. Then, the convoy is guarded by rookies. Not one of them experienced the sand for more than three months. Finally, no patrols were near the ambush point even though the road from Kabul and Bagram should be secured. Phil answered with a surprising amount of detail. That's all I know, though. He added. I think it's more than enough. Clint joked. Fury entered the room with authority a few minutes later with Hill right behind him. The small chattering inside immediately, immediately died down. He walked towards the podium and eyed everyone. As you have heard, Tony Stark's convoy has been ambushed while on its way to Kabul. Preliminary reports indicate that they took Tony Stark and someone pretending to be a maintenance officer for the Jericho missile. The tech is now identified as Sergeant Frank Castle. Force Recon Fury summarized. Force Recon? Why is he posing as a tech? Clint asked. We have no idea what he is doing there. What we do know is that he's supposed to on vacation after coming home from his tour in Afghanistan. We only identified him through facial recognition. Fury replied. Natasha had an idea of how Castle got roped in, but she won't say it now. Search parties had already been sent with no results. That's where we come in. 
I want all of you to find any chatter of this happening. Look into the bagram itself for any sign of an inside job. I also want you to look into Sergeant Castle himself. Coulson, you're going to Obadiah Stain to assess the possibility of Stark making a deal to save his hide. Do the same thing with Virginia Potts too. Barton, you're going to Afghanistan with a strike team on you. Make sure to bring a medic in case something went awry. Romanoff, work your contacts to find anything at all. He ordered. Natasha's order, of course, is a cover for her to extract information on Naruto. Fury already accepted the fact that Naruto just knows a lot more than he is letting on. Fury was about to shout at everyone to move when somebody knocked on the door. Fury gestured for one of the people close to the door to open it, revealing an agent carrying a package. The man went inside and handed it over to Fury. Natasha wanted to facepalm hard when she saw it. She specifically told Naruto not to do anything. Sir. A package was delivered in the reception addressed to you. We scanned it three times to make sure it's clean. The agent reported. Fury opened the package and saw a piece of paper inside instead of the usual file folder. He picked it up and read it. Don't worry. I got it, Baldy number one. Maria Hill took a peek at the paper and choked herself to stop her laughter. Fury dropped the paper inside the box and glared at everyone inside the room. What are you waiting for? Christmas? Go. Fury shouted, sending most of the people inside the room to scurry away. When all personnel not in the know are out of the room, he stared at Natasha. I'm going to kill your fucking boyfriend. He promised. Chapter 46, Lemon 1 Chapter 32.5 Natasha's Safe House, New York January 31st, 2007, 2100 H Local Nice place you have here. Naruto complimented as soon as he walked into the door behind Natasha. The pair have just managed to get out of the Wakandan party. When Naruto asked Natasha where she would like for him to drop her off, she said New York. The two then walked for quite a while before they reached Natasha's apartment located in a medium-rise building located in Washington Heights. Yeah. This is one of my safe houses that S.H.I.E.L.D. knows about. They want me to monitor someone from down the hall. Natasha replied while removing her jacket, revealing her almost transparent white top and the outline of her bra. She walked towards the kitchen to grab a drink. Make yourself at home. Do you want anything? She asked. Nah. I'm good. Naruto replied. His mouth was oddly salivating and dry at the same time when he saw Natasha's figure. He's working hard just not to turn into a bubbling idiot. Karama's jeering to just fuck her didn't help him any. Natasha noticed Naruto's blank stare to nowhere in particular. Naruto? Hey, Naruto. Are you okay? Natasha called his name, breaking him from his trance. Naruto shook his head to remove, remove the cobwebs. Yeah. Just thinking about what Chala told me. Naruto lied. I should probably go now. He added, thinking about how he should remove himself before he could do something he regrets. Oh. Natasha silently let out, hiding her disappointment. She had so much fun in the last few days that she doesn't want it to end abruptly. Even if they could just chat for the whole night, she would love it. Naruto started to walk out of the door, a heavy feeling settling on his chest. He turned to face Natasha again when he crossed the threshold. Just toss the knife to the ground if you're ready for a second date. Naruto said with a wink, hiding his disappointment with how the night would end. Okay. Natasha replied with a small smile. 
At least she's the next one that would dictate when they would meet again. Naruto didn't know what else to do at this point, and he's just standing around awkwardly, so Natasha decided to throw him a bone. Aren't you supposed to give a kiss goodbye before leaving? She asked. Her voice is dripping with sensuality. Naruto's posture suddenly changed from awkward to alert, thinking about how maybe the night could end in a more memorable note. He just has no idea how right he is. Naruto raised his hand and cupped Natasha's face. He leaned in close, keeping his eye open until the last second before contact, trying to remember every detail of this moment. He even unconsciously activated his shinigan, forever imprinting the moment in his brain. Good thing Natasha closed her eyes when she felt Naruto's warm hand on her face. She could feel the calluses on his hand, especially the thumb. The rough texture highlighted by her heightened senses. If that's how his hands feel, what more could his lips do to her? She didn't have to wait long, though, because she felt Naruto's chaste kiss on her lips. Natasha finally conceded that there's some truth to those cheesy romance movies, because she felt fireworks going off. The contrast to how all those other kisses she experienced before is massive. All too quickly for her preference, the kiss ended. Both of them opened their eyes as Naruto pulled back. They can see the hunger, the longing they have for each other. Fuck it. Naruto whispered to himself as he saw Natasha shyly bit her lips. He's throwing caution to the wind and just went at it again. Naruto gave Natasha a deep kiss without any warning and slowly pushed her inside the apartment. He closed the door by kicking his foot backward. He's trying to gauge Natasha's willingness to move forward by looking for any sign of resistance, but it seems like she's all for it too, so he started cupping her perfectly shaped ass. Natasha couldn't help but release a purr of pleasure when Naruto started massaging her butt. She started removing Naruto's jacket. A real challenge since he doesn't seem to want to separate from her. Naruto took Natasha's lead and started stripping her too. He momentarily activated his shinigan again to find the bedroom. He started leading them to the bedroom, leaving a trail of clothes behind. Natasha had no idea they were moving to the bedroom until she felt something hit the back of her legs. Her surprise caused her to separate from Naruto for a moment and looked around. She noticed three things right away. One, they are in the master bedroom, no idea how Naruto managed to find out where it is. Two, Naruto has stripped her down to her underwear, somehow removing her skinny jeans while not removing her boots. Finally, Naruto has a massive erection going on, only stopped by his pants. It's not fair. Natasha said with a small pout. What's not fair? Naruto asked. You're still wearing your pants while I'm here standing in my underwear. Natasha explained while tugging on her panties and bra, giving Naruto a show. That can easily be arranged. Naruto replied with a small grin. He unbuttoned his pants and shimmied it off, causing one of men's worst nightmares, a lady laughing as soon as you get your pants off. Ha ha ha. Oh my god. Natasha let out a full-bodied laugh. Where did you find that? She asked. Naruto let out a sigh of relief. It seems Natasha was laughing at his underwear. Hey. It's awesome. Naruto defended. I'm not denying that it's awesome. Natasha replied, placating Naruto. But where did you get a bright orange boxer with a fox eating ramen on it? Akihabara. Naruto confessed with a dropping expression. Don't be sad. Natasha whispered close to Naruto's ears. She grabbed Naruto's impressive length through the boxer and started stroking it. We still have a long night in front of us. She added before turning them around and pushing Naruto onto the bed. Natasha took a step back and did a small dance, 
shaking her hips to an imaginary tune and moving her hands across her body. Making sure she doesn't reveal too much too early. Naruto is enjoying the show a little too much. His boner is straining against his boxers. His last shred of self-control snapped when Natasha unfastened the front clasp of her bra but held it in place with her arms. He pulled Natasha onto the bed and forcefully removed her arms from her chest. Naruto placed both of her arms above her head and held it in place with his left hand. He moved his lips to her ears and whispered in a gravelly voice. You tease too much. Naruto bit her ear before moving down her body, leaving small kisses on her milky white skin. When Naruto reached her chest, he moved the bra away using his teeth, revealing her beautiful, shapely breast. At the center of each breast is a pinkish-brown areola topped by a large nipple. He kissed around left Natasha's areola before grabbing the nipple with his teeth, teeth, making her release loud moan. Natasha's senses are continuously assaulted with pleasure. The slight show of domination turned her on. Along with Naruto's nipple play and his right rand unconsciously massaging her inner thigh, she might just come without him touching her pussy. It seems she's not too far off since when Naruto unlatched from her left nipple and started paying attention to the right one, she released a small orgasm, drenching her black lace panties more. She let out a small whine while shaking her hips to let Naruto she wanted more. Good thing Naruto took the hint since he started moving down her body, still leaving little nips and kisses behind. Naruto released Natasha's arms and spread her legs apart. He placed small kisses on her inner thigh while his hands rub it up and down, further heightening her senses. Without warning, he ripped off her panties. That's one of my nicest pairs. Natasha whined without any heat behind her voice. I'll fucking buy you a store. Naruto replied. He ran his right thumb up and down her labia, particularly paying attention to her clitoris, while his left hand keeps on massaging her abdomen and thighs. So you're a natural redhead, huh? He commented with a small chuckle, causing Natasha to slap the back of his head lightly. Naruto did a light pass through her folds with his tongue, tasting her sweet nectar. Natasha released another light orgasm. She can't even moan since her voice is like getting away from her. Naruto kept on lapping up the juices she's releasing, while occasionally giving deeper passes inside of her. His tongue is scraping the insides of her walls, while he continuously plays with her clitoris and nipples. All she could do was grab onto his hair and squeeze her thighs around his head. Natasha can't even count how long it been or how many orgasms she released, but she knows she needs something a little more substantial. She pulled Naruto up by the hair to her face and kissed him deeply. Tasting herself inside his mouth just makes her all the hornier. Removed it. Natasha whispered. Naruto quickly stood up and removed his boxers, revealing his ten inch, ten inch cock to all its glory. He covered her with his body again and kissed her. Condoms? Naruto asked between kisses. Are you clean? Natasha returned. Yes. No need. Just fuck me. Natasha ordered a little desperately. Naruto grabbed his cock and lined it up with Natasha's folds and thrust it in. Natasha never felt so filled before. Her walls are straining just to keep Naruto's cock in. She involuntarily bit Naruto's collar just to keep herself from screaming. It's sad to say, but it's like she's a virgin all over again, back in the red room where the matrons forced a dildo inside of them. Luckily for her, Naruto had the presence of mind not just to start thrusting in and out of her. She needs time to adjust to his size and for him to adjust for her tightness. You can move now. Natasha whispered to Naruto after a few minutes. Naruto started with small motions, making sure that Natasha doesn't get hurt while they're having sex. But with how wet she is right now, 
Naruto quickly sped up his thrust as well as adding different motions. It continued for a while before he felt something spraying on his cock and abdomen accompanied by tightening of her pussy and tensing of her body. Did you just squirt it? Naruto asked to which Natasha shyly nodded. Oh, that is so hot. He exclaimed before turning Natasha around and started fucking her doggy style while pulling her hair back until her walls tightened again. But this time, Naruto went with the flow and released his load deep inside her. Natasha could feel his hot seed flowing inside her, which caused her to or orgasm again. After coming down from her high, she could liquids flowing down her thigh. She has no idea if it's Naruto's cum or her juices, but it sure is coming from her pussy. Naruto didn't even soften up after the release, so she turned around without removing his cock inside of her and laid him down. Her flexibility making the maneuver a lot easier. Natasha rode Naruto in a cowgirl position. She grabbed his hands and placed it on her chest, encouraging him to knead and play with them. She moved her hips up and down, left and right, forwards and backward, even small circles, coaxing his cock to release more of his cum. But Naruto somehow keeps hitting her G-spot, sending her to either a series of orgasms or a long one. For once, she didn't mind the experience she acquired. Naruto is watching mesmerized at how erotic Natasha is moving right now. He could honestly say he never saw something like this before. It didn't take long before he felt that familiar pull again. He grabbed Natasha's hips and pulled her down, ramming his cock up as deep as it could go. Natasha felt his dick impale her deeper than she ever felt, causing her walls to tighten again. Just like before, he released his cum inside her. This time, it partially bloated her abdomen. She knows that one small jolt and all his cum would rush right out, so she laid on top of him. Wow. Natasha let out while brushing her hair up with her hands. She never felt this exhausted and energized at the same time. You could say that again. Naruto replied, his cock still inside her. He could feel the small quivers of her walls. He gave one little kiss on Natasha's crown. Chapter 36.5 Natasha's Safe House, New York June 30th, 2007, 1900 H. Local Is he finally out of his self-righteous streak, huh? Jessica asked, exasperated. Don't get me wrong. I had fun with those dates, but that's not exactly what we agreed on. Not really. We need to give him the last push. Natasha replied. The two of them are sitting on the couch. Natasha called her over while Naruto is off doing one of his stuff to talk about their arrangement. How hard is it to get a guy into a threesome? Isn't that like on their top list right down below a harem and having a large dick? Jessica exclaimed vulgarly. Oh, he has no problems with the second one. Natasha automatically replied before clearing her throat, pushing her embarrassment away. He's just an emotional guy. He needs some form of connection before doing anything intimate with someone. She explained. Ugh. Jessica released a groan. What's your plan? She asked. We're going to have sex. Natasha replied with a sexy grin. Jessica choked on her spit when she heard Natasha's answer. What? Jessica yelled in surprise. Natasha moved closer towards Jessica and started to run her hands from her neck down her busts. She moved closer to Jessica's ear and blew a single puff of air. We're going to have hot lesbian sex. The moment Naruto entered that door, his instincts would take over. Natasha continued sexily, eyeing her like she's her prey. That's when Jessica notices their attire. Natasha's wearing a red lace panty and black string blouse, while she is wearing dark blue short shorts and a semi-transparent white shirt. 
she didn't resist since one way or another, she could get some release. Natasha noticed Jessica didn't really fight her advances, so she went with it. She held onto Jessica's nape and pulled her close, giving her an exploratory kiss. When she felt that Jessica is receptive to it, she gave her a deeper one. While she's Frenching Jessica, her free hand is snaking up Jessica's blouse. When she reached her boobs, Natasha gave it a light squeeze, which caused Jessica to release a moan. As retaliation, Jessica slipped her right hand under Natasha, Natasha's panties and stroke her folds. This just makes Natasha's assault more aggressive. Natasha unlatched her left hand from Jessica's nipples to grab her ass. Natasha pulled Jessica close to her then laid her down on the couch. She stopped kissing Jessica for a moment and recomposed herself. We need to move faster. He'll be here in ten minutes. Natasha said while removing her top and panties. Jessica didn't even question Natasha and just followed her lead. She removed her shirt and shorts, revealing her perky boobs and pinkish white nipples and her trimmed pussy. Natasha gave Jessica another kiss before turning around and aligning her cunt to Jessica's face. Jessica immediately started licking Natasha's folds. Natasha returned the favor and used her fingers to play with Jessica's clitoris. That's how Naruto found the two of them, hungrily eating each other out. Am I missing something? Naruto said. He would have been shocked by the whole thing, but his libido is getting the best of him. How could it not? Two hot chicks going hard at it would cause any man to turn into a bubbling mess. Jessica decided she waited too long, so she went to me. Natasha replied with an innocent face while licking away Jessica's juice from her face. You're not going to make us wait any longer, are you? She asked in a sultry voice. Jessica's eyes are glazed over. Natasha has been eating her for quite a while, and it certainly turned her fires on. Naruto didn't even bother stripping, and just sealed away all of his clothes. The problem was, he didn't know what to do next. Natasha reached for Naruto's hand and pulled him closer, while Jessica continued eating her out. She held grabbed Naruto's cock and started stroking his cock. She first gave a simple lick to the head, but that's enough for him to let out a large moan. Natasha then placed the head of his cock and started blowing it. She is slowly putting his cock deeper and deeper until she's finally deep-throating it. Naruto remembers the first time Natasha did it, he comed fucking quickly. When he's more than ready, Natasha releases him lined his cock to Jessica's cunt. She rubbed his dick through Jessica's folds and pushed it in. Jessica could feel Naruto's cock sliding into her, pushing her pussy's capacity to the limit, the length and girth are almost too much for her. Natasha turned around, cupped her face, and pecked her on the lips. Told you, he has no problem. Natasha cheekily commented, but Jessica is too out of it to reply. Naruto started moving a few minutes later. Natasha kept on kissing Jessica to push her past the discomfort and into pleasure. She moved her hands to Jessica's clit and started moving it in small circles. Jessica moaned hard as she cummed on Naruto's cock after Natasha started playing with her clit. The assault on her senses is almost too much for her. Natasha lifted her ass, wiggled it in front of Naruto. My turn. Natasha said. You're too into this, Haim. Naruto commented as he pulled out of Jessica, causing her to moan. Maybe, but don't dare deny that you love. Natasha never got to finish her statement since Naruto started pounding into her with reckless abandon. Jessica slowly snapped out her stupor and started suckling on Natasha's tits that are jiggling just above her. It was time for Natasha to come. She squirted all over Jessica, but Naruto didn't get to finish. That's why he pulled out of Natasha and rammed his dick hard deep into Jessica. Natasha turned around again, 
bringing her face close to Naruto's dick as it moves in and out of Jessica. She stuck out her tongue and started licking from Jessica's clitoris all the way to Naruto's length. The erotic scene was enough for Naruto to come, but at least he has enough presence of mind to pull out of Jessica and rammed his ten-inch cock down Natasha's throat and released his seed straight to her stomach. As he was about to be finished, slowly pulled out, releasing a mouthful of cum on Natasha's mouth. Natasha sat down on Jessica's face and shook her hips, urging her to keep on eating her. Natasha opened her mouth, revealing a mouthful of cum to Naruto. She then got off Jessica and started kissing her, transferring Naruto's spunk to Jessica. Jessica had no idea how she got into that situation. She never would swallow anyone's cum, but the whole thing just turned her erotic side onto the maximum, that she went along to anything sexual. She cupped Natasha's cheeks and started kissing her back. Both of them are playing with the cum inside of their mouths until Jessica eventually swallowed. Natasha and Jessica turned towards Naruto, while kneeling on the floor, and opened their mouths while sticking their tongues out, showing him that it's empty. Naruto's libido levels skyrocketed, seeing their display. We're not fucking done. Naruto asserted. Naruto walked towards the pair and looped his arms around their hips and carried them to the bedroom. Come by morning, Natasha would be reminded in the morning to turn on the apartment's blackout protocol since the front door has been plastered with different iterations of the same message. Shut the fuck up.